All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Data Fest Africa 2023. All right, so good to have you all. Please, if you're standing, uh, please let's move into the hall and have a seat. We're starting, so let's move into the hall and have a seat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's, let's work like tech. Guys and ladies, let's move fast. Let's be agile. <laughs> let's be agile. All right, I know a lot of us want to take pictures. It's okay to do that. But you can do that while you are seated. All right. So good morning once again. My name is Ola Lekon Aki Sunday, and I'm going to be your co-host for today. And I have my friend here Ifeoluwa Oshashono good morning it's good to be here awesome so good to be here guys and today we're going to be taking you on a journey all right a journey that will be memorable a journey that you all will enjoy right so as much as possible we want us to do this together we have a lineup of activities you know for today a lot of fantastic speakers are already in the house all right and i can assure you that you are going to go home with something great, something magnificent today, all right? So, if I, how are you feeling today? <laughs> um, I've been holding my breath to be here, and now that I'm here, I can't wait for us to get started with day two. Amazing, amazing. I feel terrific also. I feel so, so good. And it would be nice to just know how we are feeling in the room. If you don't mind, echo your feelings. How are you feeling today? No, 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 I can't hear that. How are you feeling today? Oh, the good habits, just good. Who, who else is feeling great? <laughs> Hungry. <laughs> okay. Who else is feeling amazing? Sorry? Okay. Okay, good. So, majority of us are feeling good, if uh, so it means That's that we are, we are ready to get started, yeah. right? We're getting ready, ready to get started. Okay, now, we're going to just do some quick exercises, right, before we get started, right? We have our speakers here. And it's good that we're starting at, at this time. Um, but I know you, some of us have been standing, right? But I want us to just stand again, if you don't mind, right? And quickly just meet somebody, meet the person beside you. I want it to be that you don't leave this all without knowing the name of the person you are sitting beside. Even if the person, you already know the person, turn to the back and meet someone. Can we quickly do that? In the next two, three minutes, meet somebody. Please meet somebody. Meet somebody. Say hi to your friends. Say hi to everyone sitting around you. This is a good time to make friends, I think. It is. This is the largest gathering of tech professionals anywhere in Africa, right? Even anywhere in the world. So you want to maximize it. Meet somebody. If you are sitting beside your friend, turn to your back and meet somebody. Okay, I see all the connections. Okay, I see all the card exchanges. Oh, interesting. I see all the laptop exchanges in the house. Okay. <laughs> Looks good. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Um, I also want us to move forward. Can we all move forward? And just to be sure we are in the same place. It looks kind of scattered. Can we move forward, please? Data yeah. benders, please move forward. Thank you. Yeah, please, let's occupy the seats in the front, except for the, the front row. But let's, you know, because I tell you, we are expecting over 2,000 people today. So, and you are the early birds, right? You are the early birds. So as much as possible, let's sit together. If you see a space beside you, except if you are reserving it for somebody who is already here, you know, let's fill up the spaces so that when our colleagues come in, right, they would have a place to sit. So please, let's do that quickly. I think we are right on time. Um, our keynote speaker is around. So, but before I bring the keynote speaker on, ladies and gentlemen, please, we want you all to be seated. If you are still taking picture of the picture, uh, photo booth, it's a wrong thing you're doing. You are wrong. So please you're come, wrong. <laughs> come and sit down, right? Please, let's do that. Come and sit down, please. Sit down, sit down. So that when we have our keynote speaker, it won't be distracted. All right, so let's set some ground rules, if I, what do you think? Yes. Let's now, we're going to have a chant, right? Because it's Data First Africa. So we're going to lead the chant. When we say Data First... You say Africa. So can we do that together? Data First... No, no, no. It looks like I'm only... This, I'm only hearing that from this hangul. Can we say that again? Data First... Okay, now this place. But I can't hear from... Oh, those guys are still taking pictures. Okay, that's nice. Data First... Amazing. Thank you so much. Now, if you want to take pictures and post on your social media handles, please feel free to do that, right? Just, just make sure you use the hashtag, hashtag DataFest Africa, right? Very important. And, um, you know, I know you're meeting somebody, right? So if you've also met somebody today, you want to also tag them, right? So that they know that you're not here alone. All right. So we're going to get started now with a keynote session. All right. And it's the speaker is going to be speaking on maximizing business value in a data-driven world. Sounds interesting? And the speaker is David Brown. So please meet David Brown. For the last 15 years, David has built robust analytics system for a worldwide clientele with D. Brown Consulting. He works as a tax and corporate finance consultant for Anderson and KPMG and is also an international consultant to the World Bank. He's a Microsoft's most valuable professional with over 20 years of experience in training and consulting. He's an accredited master trainer and master instructional designer with the Association of Talent Development and has trained more than 20,000 people for free on analytics. He's also a member of the professional bodies, including CFA, ICANN and CITN, and an advisor and consultant to the Nigeria Governors Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome David, David Brown. Brown. Please, round of applause as it comes forward. A round of applause. Round of applause, please. This man has trained over 20,000 people in analytics for free. I mean, we should celebrate him. Welcome, David. Good to have you. Thank you, thank you. Hello, everybody. So you guys are the early birds, right? Where are those late ones? When they come, what should they do? Just tell them to come press-ups, mass press-ups. You see press-ups everywhere. That's what I suggest. How are you doing? If you are considering yourself a millennial, now I can say millennials are now old. Gen Z. Let me see your hands up. I want to know my audience. Are you ashamed of being Gen Z? Uh, okay, so the rest are millennials, right? Okay, so who is looking for a job? <laughs> Why now? I hope your employer is not here. <laughs> okay, who is currently not working? Okay. Okay, so keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Currently not working and not a student. Okay, I can see some hands down. But it doesn't matter, right? As students, we still need to work, right? Who's going to pay the bills? You can't be dragging from our parents like that. It doesn't make sense, right? So one thing about business, right? If you put the slides up. Uh, one thing about business is one key thing about business is problem solving. When you want to go into a business, you want to go to an interview, 
identify the problems they have. That is number one. Do research, not research on who is the MD, who is the, no, do research on what problem does this industry generally have, right? There is someone in the world that has solved it. The industry probably doesn't know that. There's someone in the world that has solved it. Go understand that problem, how to solve it. Try and solve it, get some data. You know data is everywhere. Look for data, solve that problem before your interview, right? So when you go to that interview, yeah, generally you see how to solve it. Okay, there's a general problem around productivity. Okay, let me give you one problem everybody had. During the pandemic, everybody closed shop, obviously. Everybody was at home. There's one funny video I saw. Did you see the video in the US where animals started coming to claim, claim the territory? Say, so, oh, these useless human beings are not around. <laughs> Let's claim back our territory. Anyway, but what happened was quite a lot of companies had a big issue. Right? Of course, we had to go home and so everybody had to walk from home. But now you can see many people coming back. Why do you think they're coming back? There, there's a good reason to come back. I think for me, it's culture. You need to sustain the culture of the organization. But one big reason they're coming back is because of something they didn't have when the pandemic started. They didn't know how to measure productivity properly. Companies didn't know how to measure productivity. So then a manager says, oh, you are there, you're working. He's working on his laptop, but you can't see that he's on Facebook. So, so it's not really being productive, right? But they couldn't measure productivity well, and they still can't measure productivity. So they think you being in the seat, sitting down is productivity, it's not. So think about that's one big problem. How do you solve it? Well, you get a measure for productivity. Now, one thing about maximizing business value. Now, can we skip through the introductions? You can go to the slides on, um, there's one, just one skill you need to learn, one skill. So go to the slide, there's somewhere that says one skill. Sorry, the slides are not very clear. Okay, let's go to the next one. Good, one skill. One skill you need to maximize business value in a data-driven world, just one skill. Can we go to the skill? Click. It is, click, 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 how to measure, when it comes up. How to measure, that's the, all, the key skill you need. How to measure. I think there's a ruler there. You won't use a ruler at all times. Many people do not know how to measure. Just give you one, productivity. Many businesses need to understand, are we productive? If we are productive, that leads to income, that leads to revenue and stuff. We can't measure things very well. And experts, if you bring five experts here, ask them a question. Give me the most important steps for doing A. All those five will give you different answers. Were they wrong? Maybe not, but the fact is, <laughs> those five give you different answers because of some biases we have. So how to measure, that's number one. How can we measure? How do I measure? Anything, and there's a, there's a book out I would recommend to you, How to Measure Anything, by, uh, I can't remember his name, I think Douglas something, How to Measure Anything. Because everything can be measured. You just have to think critically. So I'm not going to show, show, talk to you about data analytics and all the Power BI or Google Analytics and stuff. Those are tools. They're just tools. You have to treat them as tools. The big skill you need to know is how to think critically on how do I measure this thing. And when I measure it, does this correlate with the outcome that I want? Another big skill in how to measure, you always need to know statistics. Yeah, you need to know statistics. Not the complex one. Who writes statistics here? I don't expect many hands. One hand at the back. Wow. Can we clap for that brave guy? Oh, and this, this guy as well. <laughs> the way they teach statistics is terrible. It's terrible in the universities. It's really, really terrible how they teach statistics. But it is such an important skill in business. Because currently, I can tell you for free, most businesses are measuring things wrongly. They're just measuring things wrongly. I have a video online on how... We measure, giving an example of a sales rep, sales rep represent, sales reps and how we determine which rep to fire. It's unfortunately the thing. Pandemic happens, you need to kind of reduce your staff force. When you now grow, you get them back. So you have like 1,000 sales reps. How do you determine who is performing better? So that's one problem. How do you measure performance? How do you do that? Think about it, and if you have an answer, then tell me. How do you measure performance? One single metric to measure performance. Now, back to the slides. Another thing is, these are three big things that affect how we measure. Overconfidence, inconsistency, 
and the complexity around probability that we don't really like. So overconfidence, we're always overconfident. We are, yes, Nigeria is one of the most confident countries in the world, you agree? We are super confident. Can you do this? Yes, of course, our guy can do it. But I haven't told you what, you, what I want to do. <laughs> Trust me, I can do it. <laughs> so that is complete overconfidence. It's a good thing, but unfortunately, when it comes to data, we need to be more accurate. How many of you have used ChatGPT? How many of you here? If your hand is not up, please today go and start using it. You have to go and start. Go to OpenAI, get a free account, and start using it. This is the most intelligent, quote, human in the world, right? But it can be very stupid at times. Who has experienced full stupidity on ChatGPT? Yes. So you can't just 100% rely on your tools. But how does it do what it does? It has all the knowledge of the world, frankly speaking, all the books, the whole internet in its head. And then it now knows how humans basically answer things. Humans have neurons in their head, all these neurons and stuff. And if you train yourself, it gets better and better and better. It's something that doesn't stop growing. Every part of your body stops growing, but those neurons keep on getting new connections and stuff. So that's how neural networks happen. And that's how ChatGPT works, right? So it can give you funny answers at times, just like we human beings, right? We didn't listen very carefully. Then we answered. We're giving some silly answer. And looking at this guy, he's still talking. Have you finished? Okay, that's not what I asked. Oh, okay, sorry. What did you ask? Why didn't you listen? So same thing with ChatGPT. Sometimes it doesn't really understand what it is you're saying or asking and gives absolutely terrible answers, right? But sometimes it also gives answers and continues to fester the error. Do you notice some people, when they make a mistake, they just continue and continue and continue instead of just standing back Oh, I've already spent 10 million naira on this thing. No, it must work. You spend another 5 million. You spend another... It's, it's really sad. But that is how we humans work, and that's also how these uh, new chat engines work. We can go back to the slides. So these three, inconsistency, right? In fact, the most powerful metric, the most powerful metric of performance in the world is how do you measure consistency, right? That's the most powerful metric. So when you say, how good is this person or that person? It is consistency. Right? Oh, how good is this person in sales? That person made like 5 million last month. I think that's the highest we've ever had. Does that sound like someone that's very good? Yeah, he made 5 million last month. The highest sales they've ever had. Put your hands up if you think that is an excellent performer. I made 5 million now. What's up with you guys? Can put hands up, hands up. Come on. He's a good performer, right? Okay, they know there's a trick question. You guys are too smart. Okay, anyway, so he made five million last month. That's fine. What did he make two months ago? He made one million. What did he make three months ago? He didn't make anything. He was ill, right? What, did he, what is he making next month? Probably he's going to make another 500,000. So you have 500,000, zero, two million, five million, one million, one million, 100,000, 100,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. 10, that will give someone a heart attack. What is this guy bringing to the table tomorrow? We don't know. Because he is what? Inconsistent. So you can be average and consistent. You're far better than someone that's all over the place, right? And that's what risk is. So business is all about risk. How do we measure risk, right? And how do we manage risk? Data can help us a lot, but you need to understand how to analyze. So let's go to another slide. The complexity and probability. Here's a simple thing you could do. So I just put some, for marketing, for example, you're measuring social media, impressions. Now, what do we mean measuring social media impressions? Is the number of impressions correlated with how many people buy that product you're selling? So as impressions go up by 20%, does our revenue go up by 20% potential revenue? That's correlation. That's another big word. Correlation, you need to know how to measure correlations, which is what ChatGPT is doing. That's all it is doing. Checking, if we say there, what word comes after there? Mostly, if you put it there, what word comes after the, the people? Or the people are, I think are, yeah? So it just, that's all it does. Give you an experiment. Everybody, take your phone out very quickly. Let's do a quick experiment on data. Take your phone out, go to WhatsApp. Everybody go to WhatsApp. You're going to send a message to someone you trust because the person will say something's wrong with you after the message. So go to WhatsApp. Everybody go to WhatsApp very quickly. Pretend you're going to send a message, right? I want you to type, um, you choose which one we type. I, let me say I, type I, I. You want to say I space, right? Type I space, I space. Have you done that? Don't send yet. 
I space. Can you see three predictions? Shout out the prediction in the middle. Shout it out. Ah. Uh, okay, see what you're going to do. You're going to click that prediction 30 times. That one. You just click, 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 click. You don't need to read. Just click, 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 click 30 times. And when you're done, if you think you are brave enough to tell us what WhatsApp said, let's hear. So just click, click, click like 30 times. And then someone should read what WhatsApp gave us, what data it gave us. So who can who has a mic? Can we who wants to read? One person at the back, uh, maybe that lady there in the middle, one person here. Okay, we have three. Uh, okay, so no, so one person at the back, sorry, one person in the middle, lady here. Okay, that's it. Can we pass the mic? Any mics? Who has a mic? So you will hear some funny things. So let's let's hear what uh, yeah. You can, you can leave your hands up, we can quickly get you. Shout out, tell us what's what's your AI or your data generated. <laughs> <laughs> can you give the mic? Can you give the mic? Yeah. Okay. Who, yeah, who has the hands up? Someone at the back had his hand up. Someone at the back first, and then, okay, let me just come down. All right. So let's listen. Give us your name. Okay. okay. Hi, good morning. My name is Ola Tunji Abdulatif. So from my keyboard here, I have, I have been a little too busy for a week, but I'm glad I can help with my phone screen for a while. And then I'm going back home and then. <laughs> OK, lady, sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah. OK, Zainab, I have to go to the bank to pick up my money from my bank, and then we can start the day. This is money, money lady. Somewhere at the back? OK, sorry. Somewhere at the back. Uh, one second, one second. OK. OK, mine says, I'm so happy to see. My name is Chine. I'm so happy to see that you're having fun with family. I hope you're doing good. I miss seeing your pictures. Um, my name is Ikechuku. I am not sure if you have any questions or concerns. Please visit the plugin settings and log in to resume watching the movie together with the following website. All right, all right. Can we give them a hand? Give them a hand, please. So, yes, yeah, so that is WhatsApp using your data. Obviously, we know that guy is a very hard worker. I would like to talk to you after. Yeah. So is using your data and then looking at correlations and looking at doing some statistical analysis, right? What usually comes after I? What usually comes after I am? What usually comes after I am good? You get, it just predicts and the models are getting so good. But let's quickly go. I want to tell you one method that you should learn to be able to do all these things well and progress with business. I know my time is almost up. Let's go to scientific method. I'll leave this, I'll send you this. I want to watch, watch this short one minute video on what the scientific method is. I hope it plays. There's some data issues, but don't worry. The audio, you need to get the audio working. Oh no, this is, get the audio. Uh oh. Can we try again? Let's try again. Let's try again with the audio. See if we can get the audio up. Okay. If we know audio, let me just go through. So, the scientific method, let the video play and I'll just talk through it. All right. So, this is just an example of how the scientific method works. Let's say you lost your phone. You've lost your phone, right? That's an observation. Then you basically have to find out, okay, where did I, where was I last? Oh gosh, you have to think, where was I last? Okay, now, okay, they're trying to make it work. Anyway, let's, let's leave that. So the scientific method, right, scientists, they have a processed way of doing stuff. They have step by step by step that you should follow. Everybody needs to make decisions that way. Okay, let's. The scientific method is about ordinary people doing ordinary things. That includes you, me, and other scientists in the world. 
The scientific method is just a process or steps taken to produce reliable results to answer a specific question. Maybe you think you don't use a scientific method in your life, but I can guarantee that you do. For example, imagine you wake up on a Saturday and you couldn't find your cell phone. That's an observation. Then you do a little research by thinking about the last time you had it. You suspect that it might be in the pocket of your pants from yesterday. That's a hypothesis. And when you check your pants, you're doing an experiment. But science and life don't always go as planned, and you find no cell phone in your pants pocket. So the second observation leads you to think again and recall what else you did yesterday. You remember that you put your cell phone in your backpack during school. So you decide it must be there, and you go and check. And lo, there it is. Life can continue, and you're so happy that you share the results with your best friend and explain why it took you so long to text them back. Science. Can I go to the next uh, slide? So this is the scientific method. We're going to go back. Yeah. Observation, research, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, share results. That whole process that you go through every day when you're trying to solve a problem, that is it. Observation, research, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, and you share your results, right? So when the data analytics guys are doing visualizations, that's sharing the results, right? Hopefully they get the correct visual so that when people see, they instantly understand what's going on, right? So observation, research, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, and sharing your results. So whether you read science or not, or you went to art, you need to learn the scientific method and use that to understand how to measure things, right? Understand how to measure things and then how to present those things. Let's go to the next slide. Right, solving problems. Next, next, next. Right. So this is how most corporates solve problems from what we discovered. They do data generation, then they, they get data first. They usually have a software. That software, unfortunately, they need that software to talk to 10 other software, so they download data. And most the preferred software for downloading it to is Excel. Then they now clean the data, kind of go through the data, cleaning it up, mashing it up, mixing it up with different things, getting a particular measure out of the data. Then they go and start presentations on PowerPoint. Then they present to management on PowerPoint. And then they brainstorm on those numbers presented. Unfortunately, most companies spend maximum 20% of their time on that brainstorming. That's the most important thing, brainstorming on what's going on. They spend a lot of their time cleaning the data, getting the data, collecting the data, not thinking through what the data is saying, right? So your jobs when you get to those companies or you're already in those companies, try and eliminate that backlog, that data, that's all that ma ma manipulation or manipulations you're doing with the data. Eliminate that so we spend time on real stuff, which is brainstorming on those numbers. And you can automate it. You can see what WhatsApp just automated for you. Send the message, but obviously you need, it needs more input from you than I, right? You know, it's really good when you say, I am, but you see some options that are really excellent, isn't it? Have you seen that? Yeah, so it's, it's using that data from you. Now, next, next slide. Let me, I have a slide where I've shown a framework for problem solving in Excel. We love Excel, so I've given an example there, but I want to go to one quote at the end. Can we go to the end? Hopefully you'll be able to see the quote. Okay, this is also important. Let me talk about this. Biases. One thing about ChatGPT and all those other software out there is they're using our data. Our data is biased. It is biased. We are biased human beings. Do you all believe me that you're all biased? Yes, yeah, some of you say, no, I'm not, I'm not. We are all biased. If you want to prove it, go to this book. Read this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Who has read it? Thinking Fast and Slow. Go and read that book. It will humble you. You will see how biased you are. And which means many decisions we make are biased. So they're not optimized decisions for making money. Yeah, they are biased, right? So if you check the board, board of directors of most companies don't have ladies, don't have women. They're mostly men. How many, what's the percentage of women in the population? It's like, let's say 50%, right? So how do you know what your, what your customer, 50% of your customers want? How do you know what to sell to them if you don't have that customer in the room. <laughs> so, so the data basically says that, right? So when women are more women in a board, those companies actually make more money. It's not, a, it's proven. When there are more women in the board, let's give women a hand. Yeah. 
But men do a lot of the heavy lifting. I hope you know. A lot of those heavy, heavy lifting is done by men. But men have decided to stop doing that. Do you know who they've employed? Robots. They now do robots and stuff. They've made robots to kind of do that. But it's important that we understand our market, right? Understand your market. And know that if your market is not represented in the decision-making process, you will not maximize your money-making, which is what companies need to make money to pay bills and stuff, all right? So back to the number one skill you need, which is what? How to what? How to measure. You need to learn how to measure. And it's nothing to do with beautiful data analytic, cloud analytic, Azure, blah, blah, or whatever skills. No, it is a thinking process. And to help you think of how to measure, use the scientific method. It's a very good method to use. There's one method we use. We are known for Excel a lot, doing a lot of Excel training. I've been doing that for like almost, what, 27 years and modeling and stuff. So we created, we coined one uh, methodology for using Excel. Uh, we, you, you say a good cook always dices vegetables rapidly. That's how to remember it. A good cook always dices vegetables rapidly. Can we go to the slide where we explain what that means? And you can take that out. I know I will need to leave now. This bias data, go online and check for something called the bias codex, cognitive bias codex. You will see what this slide is. It's a very important slide. These are all the biases we have. You can go check this out later. The cognitive bias codex, C-O-D-E-X. You see the image? And then you could check that out, but read that book of, um, what, what book did I mention about your bias? Thinking Fast and Slow, very important book. I mentioned another book too that you need to get. How to Measure Anything. Very good, very good. Go to the next slide. I need to conclude. I conclude with this statement from uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. He said, our future as a race, or as a race, it, it, our future is a race between the growing power of technology and the wisdom with which we use it. Let's make sure that wisdom wins. All right? Thank you very much, everybody. Questions? Don't know if we have time for questions, the organizers. I know I had 20 minutes. I hope I kept the time. Amazing. Yes, we can take one question. Thank you so much, David. Yes. One question from the audience. Okay. Is there a mic? Yeah, oh. we would have to use this mic. Okay. Yeah, you want to? Okay, so let's take it from there. Um, okay, so before you went in, you started about saying, um, as going into interviews, we should learn how to solve the company's problem. Yeah. So if um, you are a healthcare personnel yes. and you're going to a, a hospital, yes. let's say the general hospital, so yeah. how do you then now look at how to solve that problem? Do you first like take a survey, enter the hospital, go around, mm -hmm. or how can I reduce patient accidents? And Keep the mics, hold the mic so we'll have a conversation. Okay. So all right. So the thing is this, right? It's not solve the problem of that hospital. Okay. There, there's, I found there's lots of data on problems that hospitals have in general. If you go online, it's okay, what's the top five problems hospitals have, right? They list it out. You have chat GPT, go and say, okay, so how do you solve these problems? It'll tell you. Then you can then pick that out and say, okay, typically I've discovered from my research that hospitals have this, 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 and this problem. These are the major problems that people have. I don't know how many of them you've solved in this hospital, but I have good ideas around how to solve this and this, right? I don't know if you'd want to hear them, yeah? Yeah, so that's good, good question, good question. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much. Please give David a round of applause once again, please. All right. Uh, hi, David. So we have, we have a plaque. Hi, David. Just to honor you. Thank you so much uh, for doing this again with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Thank you so much, David. A round of applause for David, ladies and gentlemen. Amazing. I'm sure there are a lot of key takeaways. I mean, if I what a fantastic keynote session. I know, right? I know, right? <laughs> David is a wealth of experience and knowledge, so I'm not surprised. I Thank tell you. you. I tell you. Now, I want to do a quick activity. You know, remember, I'm sure you've met somebody today. So quickly turn to your neighbor, to your side or to your back, and ask them, what was your key takeaway? It's a keynote speech. So what is your key takeaway? Can you quickly do that? In one minute.
Wow. Man, the energy in the room is high. He takeaways. I mean, please let's give David another round of applause. That was, that was amazing. So for our next session, we have an expert session on data analytics and the rise of open data. And our speaker is Ademola Adesalu. Ladies and gentlemen, please meet Ademola Adesalu. Ademola led the team that set up CRC Credit Bureau Limited Infrastructure and Solution in 2018. He was also charged with the responsibility of ensuring that the company obtained the Bureau Operating License and Certification from the Central Bank of Nigeria. He was the general manager in charge of operations and technology of the organization till December 2021 following which he was appointed Managing Director of CRC Data and Analytics Limited in January 2022. He's charged with the responsibility of setting up the new entity to provide data and analytics services. His experience spans over 29 years in the fields of consulting, technology, financial auditing, business development, data analytics, and general management. Let's welcome Ademola Adesalu. Ade welcome, Ademola. Please, a round of applause for Ademola. Good morning, everyone. I am very uh, happy to be here, and I'm also glad to um, experience the energy right from the entrance to, you know, uh, everyone here. I'm here to talk to you about um, open data and essentially what I, how I thought to approach it is first of all, you know, um, provide a bit of a definition and then essentially at the end of the um, session, make you aware that, you know, there's data everywhere and, you know, allow you to start thinking of what we can do with it. Okay. Um, so. Are we ready? Okay. So essentially, open data. Open data um, essentially is data that is um, available for use um, and authorized for free uh, use by the uh, the author or the provider of the data. Uh, essentially, what they uh, why they provide this data is essentially for you to be able to do different analysis and make you know uh, insights. Uh, from it. Now, the common thing about it is that you find that most of them is governed by, uh, are provided by institutions or corporate bodies that feel that this data uh, will be of use to the, to, to the public. So where, wherever you see such data, you should be able to um, download them and use them for whatever purpose uh, that you want to, uh, to, want to do. Um, next slide, please. So, next one. So, um, when we talk about uh, open data, we want to talk about the characteristics of the data. First of all, you find that they are free to use, so there are no um, challenges with respect to uh, whether it's restricted to anyone or, or not. The, um, you can also, when you use the data, you can reuse them and distribute them also uh, uh, for, to, for other purposes. The other thing you can, they are not restrictive uh, in terms of uh, um, access to it. So uh, unlike some data that is, you know, for internal use, this one is essentially for, for public use. Next slide. And um, essentially in terms of quality and accuracy, the uh, provider uh, essentially is responsible for this, but I believe that before they put them out there, um, there's a lot of um, work that goes into ensure that they are accurate, accurate because they are, in the following slides, you will see uh, where people apply them and people depend on them for, um, uh, for certain decisions that they would make. So uh, what are the uh, various examples of uh, open data and where can you find them? You find open data, I mean, globally, I mean, there, there are a lot of them everywhere, but let's, I try to bring them down to our environment because that's where you need it. 
Um, you will find open data with the government data. Let's start with that first. Um, the Nigerian Bureau of uh, Statistics, uh, that's the previous slide, please, um, is a very good example of where you would find a lot of data about several aspects of our, our environment. Um, and then, of course, the one of the one uh, institution that have used this data and other government data effectively is budget. You, if you've heard about them, what they've done is that every now and then, when budget government you know talk about their they bring out their budget, they go in there, analyze it, and simplify it for you to use and make uh, interpretations from it. Now, if you go to the budget site, you will find them do breakdown of budget at the national level, at the state level, and even also in terms of the performance of the budget, you will find them, um, you find such analysis there. But what they've done essentially is to take data from government and then put it in a format that it is easy to understand by the citizens of that environment. Now, the other type of the other environmental use of uh, data, you have the, those who use it for social and democratic, uh, demographic uh, type. You have, um, um, there's a portal. I mean, if you can see the site, I'm sure the slides will be shared. Uh, they have the Nigerian data portal and the code for Nigeria uh, data. They also have been able to try and put together data about, you know, um, some demographic data, data about our environment that you can use uh, for, um, for analysis. Next slide, please. So then, of course, the very important one that you find those that are business inclined or finance inclined use uh, is financial data. Uh, you will find that at the CBN site. You'll find that, that at the sex site. Uh, why do people tend to use this a lot? Because you know you can do a lot of modeling around this. Um, for uh, for business use and of course for healthcare, you find people use uh, uh, data from the World Health Organization and some other um, bodies that you know um, put data together. Next slide, please. So, what are the benefits? Um, I'll just pick a few. Uh, the first one is transparency and ac accountability. And if you remember, I mentioned budgets and what they did. So you find that that the most countries that you know push for open data, uh, especially at the government level, is essentially you know providing some form of accountability to the citizens because if you can provide information about you know say budget and budget performance, for instance, um, the data uh, people, uh, my data people here can analyze it and you know actually tie whatever. Um, the uh, governor or the mayor or the uh, whoever is in charge of that environment, you can you can compare what they are saying with the with data, and of course that promotes you know the aspect of transparency and accountability that we're talking about. The other one is uh, social impact and and uh, that 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 open data gives. I mean, somebody, uh, one of the. Um, Area that I, there was this particular uh, link in the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics is called the Poverty Index. They actually did build a portal, which when you go there, you would see um, how they analyze, you know, poverty poverty index within the country and by different states. And of course, the are able to also connect um, either education level in the household. Um, the number of uh, 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 persons in the particular household to the poverty index. Now, why am I bringing all this up? Next slide, please. Uh, is that you're being aware that the, we're not, we may not be there totally uh, uh, in, in the country, but being aware that even for the data that is available, there are a lot of analysis that we can do uh, for the purpose of, you know, social improvement, financial empowerment, and even creation of new businesses, okay, to, that will solve other problems. Okay, that's why I'm, you know, making you aware. But we, the reason why, I say, the other part of not being there is that these ones can form the foundation of other types of data that can be put together. 
So imagine you now coming together as a court and say, um, I think there's a market very close to this place called, uh, I think, K2 or Mile 12. How many of you have wondered how many of those food items go in and how many of them come out? And the ones that don't come out, what really happened to them? Now, the government in the uh, agricultural sector have been talking about the agricultural value chain. Now, if a couple of you geniuses here come together and say, look, we're going to go and do a study and be publishing on a daily basis the number of trucks that brings in food, uh, food items into that environment, um, the types of food items that they bring in, how many of them you know, go bad before they are purchased? You understand? And how do these people, how can we create a value chain in there that minimizes the wastage? You know, that's a project, right? Exactly. So, and it's doable, right? So, let's look at that, and then you can see the businesses that will be created out of that. You can see the improvement in um, the quality of work, um, the throughput of the people in that environment, and of course, your, your contribution to that environment. So, that's why if you look at you know, open data and analytics, you find that the essence of it is that you get the data, the black box is where you do all the stuff that is related to um, analytics, and I'm sure they talked about that yesterday, and a number of you know that, where you taking the data, clean it, analyze, and all that. And then, of course, you produce in actionable insights. So that's why I gave you the example of the, the market there. It's a project that is very, I think, it's, I keep thinking about it. And I think that, you know, until someone cracks that, we can, you know, solve um, a problem in the area of um, agricultural value chain improvement. Next slide. So, um, in terms of use case, I think I pretty much mentioned it, agriculture and productivity, healthcare improvement. I mean, if you take your mind back to 20, uh, 2020, how many of you remembered what happened that year? Right? COVID. So how do you think that, you know, it was nipped? How did data support, you know, nipping it in the board? You notice that every country had a portal where uh, new cases, the number of new cases have been reported, the, uh, the ones that are discharged, the one that dies and all that. That is an example of a use case of open data. And it was used globally to be able to address and stem, track the, the, the spread of the disease, track the control. And of course, by the time they were now saying, okay, yes, it's over, it was exactly matched with data. Okay? So that is really the uh, part of the use case uh, of uh, this. And public infrastructure monitoring. I mean, how many of you have gone on Third Midland Bridge lately? And you notice that you know, a lot of things are happening in there. One of the things that came to mind today is that, is it possible for us to you know, take to charge the uh, Federal Ministry of Works or the Ministry of Works in every state and say, let's have data on a regular basis of the number of new roads that are being built, existing roads that are being maintained, and the ones that are, that are that have not even been touched at all. And one of the things that I, I can also deduct from there is that with such data, I can actually come up with insight on the efficiency of our spend in terms of you know, road construction um, and, uh, in Nigeria. So those are some of the things that you can, you can find yourself uh, using it for. Next slide, please. Uh, so, um, in some, some, some countries have uh, used it. I thought to bring, you know, uh, bring it home. But New York has a very robust uh, portal where you have data about every aspect of their, uh, of their environment. But in Nigeria and South Africa, I mean, South Africa used open data essentially uh, to track crime. And that's one of the use cases that they did. I mean, those of you who have been monitoring South African news know that, uh, especially in Joburg, it's really a tough area uh, in terms of crime. But they now decide to address it with data. And that is, you'll find the use case on their portal there. And of course, I mentioned the budget for you. Uh, you can, that brings it home as to what they are doing with respect to governance. Next slide, please. 
So um, this is my one of my uh, favorite, you know, ways of explaining, you know, taking on any data science project or data analytics project. Um, I, it simplifies everything. So after you know, you know, having access to this data, what, how do you then, you know, make sense of it? You must have a a, um, a use case or business problem you are trying to solve. That's why I recommend this uh, Chris model. You take the the use case, and then that allows you to then know what type of data that you want to um, um, you need to actually act, to actualize that work. And then when you get that data, you also be able to know. You also determine you know what the areas of data quality and um, the completeness of that particular data before you build your model and of course testing your model and then of course you go around after testing your model if there are any issues you go back uh, around the process so but essentially what i'm trying to uh say with the short time that i have is that open data is everywhere uh at least in um, most of the developed developed uh, uh, climbs they have been able to harness and harness it and put it in places where um, brilliant minds like yours can use them for insight development and, of course, you know, improving the society. In our own environment, we have put in some place, we didn't call it open data then, we didn't think that it's open data, but the likes of the CBN, the likes of NCC providing statistics about the growth rate of GSM and the performance of the companies that are in, that are participating in that environment, the COVID case that I gave you examples are some of the examples of open data that we have. And then, of course, the challenge to the audience here is that we have not done much. How can we, you know, start gathering data and you know make it available for the data community to build solutions? That's essentially the the message around there. So thank you very much. And I'm here to take questions. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Akin, and I want to ask, what do you think is um, the biggest issue in collecting data for Nigeria? Thank you very much. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's, that's a very good way to start. I think the biggest issue is um, one, I think the biggest issue is first of all orientation. Um, I had a conversation with someone one day and we were talking about uh, you know, market data gathering. And they say that you know you go into the market and you they see you there asking for you know what is this uh, what's the price of this today what's the price of that tomorrow and there's this sense of what why are you in my business you understand so we we need to work on orientation first uh, so for, for people to know that look without putting this, putting this data together um, we can't move forward and it's also for their own you know benefit. The second, um, uh, I think the second issue is, you know, support uh, through, through governance and uh, through, through governance. So if you have the right support, um, of course, with a bit of funding also, you can put the machinery together to be able to gather data on a, on, on a, on a, on a regular basis. And then, of course, largely is the uh, data gathering techniques, knowledge about the data gathering techniques, because I don't think that the climbs that have um, improved or you know matured today just got there overnight. You understand? So once we're able to put together that mechanism uh, together, it will also help. I think there was somebody there. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ademola. Please give Ademola a round of applause once again. Thank you so much. Okay, so yeah. we have one question. Okay, let's let's take that. I hope we can do a quick one. Um, good morning. My name is Daniel. So <clears throat> the question I have is if, like you said about data gathering and 
there's a problem with data, data gathering. So if now, like you said, we're meant to build solutions, how are we meant to go about building solutions if I don't exactly trust that the data is accurate because there's not enough data gathering. So for like, for example, like in rural areas now, we don't know how well data has been gathered there. How do I trust that I can build solutions with the data that is available? Thank you. So there are two parts to the question. First of all is um, gathering the data. The second part is data quality. Now, the, for every project like of, of such nature, um, there, there are processes involved. And what happens is that the, for a, a typical project, like I mentioned earlier, before the data is gathered, there has to be um, a, a set of matrices that will be put in place. And of course, there's, a, there's also a governance model. When I say governance model, what, what the governance model means is that um, there will be uh, a collector checker validation you know, process before it's uh, it's published for use you understand that's what what happens in every climb anyway whatever data you want to get the data data of the attendance here we have a measure we have a means of measuring it but somebody still needs to validate or put some testing and those that are into statistics know how to take a sample of a population test it for quality issues before uh before you so the governance will handle that aspect of it Amazing. Thank you so much, Ademola. Thank you so much. Please, another round of applause for Ademola. Thank you so much. Ademola, we really appreciate it. I would like to just present this back to thank you for sharing your time, your expertise with this amazing audience. We really appreciate you. On behalf of our Data Fest Africa organizers, we present this to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you. Please, another round of applause as it goes back to his seat. If I what a fantastic time. I know, I, I know. I am sure the guys in this room are very smart and a lot of startup ideas were coming through. True, true. Also, effective strategies to, you know, building your data solutions. So it was a good session. I tell Thank you. you. And I know that one of my key takeaways really is the fact that, look, we can start an agri-tech business where you just help optimize the value chain using data. That's a massive idea. So we want to do one thing. Now you're going to turn to your neighbor again and just share with them what is your key takeaway? What is that business idea that you have been able to glean from that fantastic session? Let's do that quickly in one minute. Key takeaways. Has the person, can we work together? It's important. Yes, yeah, yes. Can we work together? Can we build the next Big business together. You need to ask that person. The people at this side, you guys are not interacting. All right. All right. Honestly, I see billions and millions and trillions of dollars in this room just by this exchange of ideas. So, guys, it doesn't end here. We want to encourage you as we go through the entire session. Bring out your writing part. Write the ideas that are coming, right? Ademola has told us how we can leverage open data to start businesses, to start, to start social enterprises. He has given the example of budgets. If you go read about budgets, you see how it all started. How can we help governance, you know, make data-driven decisions? That's it. So I am sure that with those use cases, we all are going to start Social enterprises, amazing unicorn startups will emerge from here. All right? So thank you so much. Now we're going to go to the next session. It's a lightning talk. And so our lightning talk will be taken by Stephanie Egberiba. And she'll be speaking on first train inclusivity in the tech industry. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, you want to give a round of applause for Stephanie as she comes forward to take us on this journey. All right. Keep it up, keep it up, keep it up. Let's do this. It's a lightning talk, 10 minutes talk, but I assure you it's a punchy talk. So you're, you're going to enjoy it. All 
All right, so she's making her way to the front. Okay. So while we wait for Stephanie to come up, let's continue exchanging those ideas. Those ideas are very important, guys. I tell you, if that's your main takeaway today, then it's worth it. Knowing well that you can start a business. You don't have to wait for a job, right? You can start a business, start a project that solves major data issues. So Stephanie is coming, so please give her a round of applause. As Very she sounding yeah. one. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. Good to have you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, you can't hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. I know she can hold one. Ladies and gentlemen, imagine a world where tech isn't just about innovation, but a place where everyone feels they truly belong. Today, I stand before you to share a journey, a journey into the tech world, a world that seems vast and intimidating, but turned out to be quite inviting and a welcoming place. But before I dive into this journey, allow me to introduce myself. I am a Gariba Stephanie Osasune. I'm a Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador, a student of Yaba College of Technology. I'm a data analyst, a product designer, and an advocate for inclusivity and diversity. Well, let's begin. As we discuss fostering diversity and inclusion, let's consider the foundations upon which real change can be built. Over recent times, there has been a significant focus on diversity trainings, yet the results have often fallen short of our expectations. We should come to understand that diversity training is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It should contain diverse perspectives, recognizing that diversity varies across different regions and cultures. Learning about diversity and inclusion is a continuous journey, one that we all must take, we must take ownership of. It is not only limited to certain training sessions or certain training programs. It is a continuous journey. It is one that spans through our daily interactions and experiences. Now let's circle back to our main thing, breaking barriers. Well, let's start with this simple but yet profound statement, in quotes and in quotes, just go for it. These words hold immense power, especially for us young individuals. As someone venturing into the tech world, it's easy to feel daunted, isolated even. When you walk into the assessment room and then you find out you are the only one that looks like you in the room. But I'm here to tell you, being different can be your greatest strength. You know, tech isn't just about coding or algorithm. It involves diversity of thought, diversity of ideas, and diversity of backgrounds. It involves coming together to create solutions, to bring ideas that will impact the world positively. So as someone who is venturing into the tech world, it's, it's easy to feel lonely, alienated even. When you walk into the assessment room and then you look like you are noticeably different from the others. Well, I'm still here to tell you, don't try to assimilate. Embrace your uniqueness and celebrate what makes you you. Well, why is this so important? The face of the tech world is actively changing. 
it's evolving and it's becoming more inclusive. There's a great recognition that tech isn't just a checkbox. Diversity isn't just a checkbox. It's the key to innovation. Companies are act actively taking part in inclusivity and diversity initiatives. Well, that is good. That is beautiful. But the real change starts when you, as a young person, you as a young man, you as a young woman, we all take our seats on the table. Diversity education often falls short when it is offered as a one-size-fits-all approach. It should not be that way. You know? Learning about diversity, we should challenge those stereotypes. We should challenge those assumptions. We should understand that diversity is not a monolith. It is the tapestry of individual experiences. So I challenge us all today. Let's fight those stereotypes. Let's not back out on, on, on diversity. Let's not back out on inclusion. Let's give an opportunity for everyone to share their unique stories and share their, share their unique perspective and experiences. Well, as for me, I started tech two years ago and it wasn't very, very easy for me, but I'm glad I'm here. And this, I want to thank Data First Africa for giving me the beautiful, beautiful opportunity to do this. I want to say a very big thank you and Ubuntu. Thank you. So we're going to take questions. So if you have questions for Stephanie, please raise your hand so we can uh, take your question. Questions for Stephanie, please. Okay, looks like the message is clear. Okay, we have a question here. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi, Stephanie. My name is Victor. Um, I'm inspired by your story. So my question is simple. Um, times when you walked into spaces where you were, you know, you looked um, different from every other person, how did you come to accept your genuine feeling? You know, sometimes we like to mask our feelings. I'm very sure sometimes you felt a type of way. How did you come to accept that feeling? How did you process it? And how did you move past it to effect change? Well, if I go for events or spaces, I usually accept that, yeah, I am who I am. It is me. This is me. And I always bring confidence to the table. I'm not going to change that for anybody or anything. And this wheelchair, I'm not, I call this, this my throne. It's my Ferrari. <laughs> so any bias or opinion, I don't think I'll be here today if I considered all those things. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Stephanie. This was a great session. We really appreciate you. Are there any other questions for Stephanie before she leaves? Oh, okay. We have one more question. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Stephanie. Thank you. That was a very great session. I want to ask, was there any time that the negative energy was so much and you could know in as much as you had something to bring to the table, you had a change, you had a solution, but because of that energy, you could not do as much as you want to do. And in the case where it seemed like that's about to happen, how did you deal with that? Um, yeah, there were times where I had negative energy. I don't know if my mom is in the crowd right now, but my mom is my strength. She has, she has always told me to keep pushing. She has always told me to keep moving. She, she would say, your bones may be fragile, you know, but you are strong. You are strong hearted. You are strong. So whenever I face those negative challenges, I would always tell myself I am strong and I can go past it. I would always look at myself in the mirror and I would say, you've done this, you've done that, you've done this, you've done that. So what is this one that you cannot do? Yeah. So, yeah. And I, you know, 
yeah, that's it. I have wonderful people around me too. And also the Lord, yeah. So thank you. Amazing. Please give Stephanie a round of applause, a loud round of applause. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you. So we have this token to present. Stephanie, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Wow, what a, what a fire session. Please, a round of applause as Stephanie makes her way downstage. I'm sure we are all having a good time today. I see, I see that. The energy in this room is really high. And thank you, and thank you, and thank you, really. You guys are making the day happen, right? So, we're going to do just a little activity before the next session, which is a panel session, right? And some of our panelists, uh, panelists are already here, right? But before we take them on stage, I still want us, right, to exchange. So for the next five minutes thereabout, we're going to be exchanging. Meaning that you would stand up, meet someone briefly. It's a, remember, we just had a lightning talk. So you're going to have a speed dating. Speed. Nice. Yeah. So it's a speed dating. So you're going to meet somebody that you've not met today. Five minutes. And you're going to speed date with them. Share with them. What do you do? How can we work together? Is there anything you want me to know about you? Let's do that in five minutes. The time starts now. Now, this is a good time, I promise. Speed dates. I've given you the clue. What's your name? What do you do? What's the idea you've picked up today? How can we work together? So the timer is on. Five minutes. I can see some people still seated. The time is now. You need to meet somebody. The next business co-founder is in this room. So you need to meet that person. And it's not enough to just ask for their name. You need to know what they do. Find a point of similarity. That's the essence of speed dating. Get their contacts if possible. Exactly. So that you can ask that. If you ask them, will you marry me? They will say yes. So marrying does not mean relationship of marital relationship, but business relationship. <laughs> so please, let's do that. Amazing conversations are going on. I can see it. I tell you, million dollar conversations right here. If you are not meeting somebody new, <laughs> you are wrong, guys. You are, you are wrong. not meeting somebody new. You are wrong.
So you got two more minutes. So if you are still speed dating, this is the moment where you should have your aha moment with that person. That striking moment that, oh, yes, yes, I get that. Yes, exchange contacts. If you're, if you're cool with that, why not? That's the purpose of speed dating. Wow. A lot of connections are going on here. If you're not speaking to someone new, you are wrong. 100% wrong. <laughs> you are wrong. All right. Okay, so one more minute to 10.20. Yeah, take pictures with the person. I think we can call them up. What do you think? All right, so it's 10 20. I'm sure you have a solid relationship, a solid relationship already with that new person. So that's a good one. All right, so you can wrap up now and disengage. <laughs> so the next activity that we're going to do now is something very interesting. All right, so we have one, two, three, four rows here. Yeah? Okay. Still engaging, okay. So we have all these four rows. I'm going to call on a guy and a lady. Please, let's listen up, guys. Listen up, listen up, listen up. Let's wrap it up. Thank you, know? you. Exactly. Remember, it's speed dating. So if you are still dating, if you are still speaking to that person now, you didn't do a good job. <laughs> so listen up. Now we have four rows. So what we want to do now is what I will call tell your story. Remember, Stephanie just told us about our own story, and I find it very fascinating. But we know that there are a lot of us here that have a story, something to inspire us. Maybe how you started your tech journey, or something that, you know, an obstacle that you've gone past, in, maybe at work, or in your personal life that you want to share. All right? So we're going to call a guy and a lady from each of the row. If you are interested, if you want to share with us, We'll do this for another 10 minutes thereabout. We want to hear people's story. And remember, guys, listen up. Listen up, guys. When you are telling your story, the goal is to inspire, right, and to provoke action. So inspire somebody, right? So let me tell you my own story so I can start. Maybe if I can start and say hers, then we're going to call people in the house and they can come talk to us. Sounds good. So my story... Story, 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 story. All right, my story is, is a fascinating one, right? Now, educationally, right, I had an education background in social sciences, right? Psychology, to be precise. Listen up, guys. Now, at the time I was leaving school, even though I'd been doing some, you know, basic data here and there with SPSS, 
but I was preparing to be a human resource manager. So at that time, you know, I'd, I'd completed CIPM. For those who know CIPM, I was already chartered. HR, I was ready for HR. But as fate will have it, my first job after school was in a tech environment where I was a technical writer. And then all of a sudden, I got really interested in tech. And then became a technical writer, subsequently became a data analyst, subsequently became a data engineer, and then now I'm a data scientist. Now, the story here is looking at how I moved from non-tech background, psychology. Do, do we have anybody, any psychology graduate students in the house? Okay, nice. And then moved into data science. I mean, for me, anytime I look at that story, I still fascinate myself. Like, man, guy, you have tried. You don't try. You know, so that's my story. I hope somebody is inspired. Interesting. Right. Interesting. So if I tell um, us. Lepon's story is particularly interesting because just yesterday, somebody was asking about how difficult it is to get into tech as someone that does not have a science background, right? And the host, as at yesterday, was trying to inspire the person, oh, you can do it. It is something that you can do. There are a lot of people that do the same thing. And I hope the person is here, and I hope she just heard Lekon's story, and I hope that she's inspired. Thank you very much. So to my own story, I'm going to keep it short. Unlike Lekon, I had an engineering background. I studied production engineering in the university. And then I got exposed to statistics like in the fourth year of my undergraduate study. And I just started to get interested in data at that point. Right? Do a little bit of Excel here, um, gather data here and there. And that was how my journey started. And just after school, I took up a data science opportunity. But I, I think that the this, this story here is that you can do anything that you set your mind to, regardless of your background. So whether a non-science background or a science background, really, you can do it. Yes, you can do it. All right, guys, remember that speed dating is over. Now we are taking stories. So please, if you're still standing, I still see a lot of folks at the back there. Kindly have your seat. You need to hear somebody's story. So please have your seat. Please go take your seat now. Speed dating should be paused. You're still going to speed date afterwards. So if you'd like to share your story with us, a guy and a lady from each of the row, please just raise your hand, right? Raise your hand and we'll call you to come share your story with us, okay? So I see, okay, so I'll just give you a number. So one, a lady, okay, two. So we have two persons there, okay, one, a guy. Okay, the guy there, two, okay. Would like to tell your story? Please, if you don't mind, just come forward as I point, point at you. So the two persons here and the two persons there. I think I have a lady in front and a guy at the back. Please come to the front. Would like to share your story, okay, one, okay. And then two, please come to the front. Where are the ladies? I'm okay. rooting for you. Yeah, come share your come. story. And then the guy, please come. Thank you. I know we all have interesting stories, right? So we just want to hear your story. We want it to inspire and provoke action. Inspire and provoke action. So, all right. Okay. Looks like I have more people. <laughs> okay. Looks like no problem. No problem. We would, we'll do this together. So, basically, tell us your name, what you do. All right, and tell us that story. Do that in one minute, thereabout, please. Keep it short okay. and sweet. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll start from this row and then we'll go over there. Okay, so please, oh, yeah, you have the floor. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Gift Wareta. I'm currently the senior customer intelligence and reporting analyst for PAGA, I fintech. Um, my background is in zoology, and till today, I still love zoology. Why I love zoology is that it brought, it made me to be able to recognize the power of critical reasoning, and I think that's one of the things that has helped me till now to succeed well in the space of data analysis, data science, and business process automation. So what I want to tell someone out there is that irrespective of what you, you've, you've studied, look deep into yourself and recognize your strengths. 
Zoology actually pushed me, you know, this far. I schooled in the north, spent all my life in the north. But I'll tell you, over the past few years, I've not only grown in my career, okay. I've helped also in training thousands of people. Thank you very much. In data. Thank Give you him a much. round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank now, we're going to do 30 seconds. I want to see how fast you can do it. Your name and one striking thing about you. So, a lady now. 30 seconds. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. My name is Ife, Ife Oluwa Oduwai. I am a 400 level computer engineering student. I've actually been in data science for roughly two years now. And I have um, roughly nine months of work experience. So I got into data science because I, I don't like being broke as a student. And I was looking for something I can use as a side hustle. Amazing. And, um, Amazing. Thank you so much. The story is clear. <laughs> Please give her a round of applause. Thank, thank you, you very much, much Ife. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ilisomi Kolawali. Uh, I'm a fresh call member. I just did my POP. That was two days ago. So I, I started, I started uh, uh, data, the data journey because I was broke. That was last year. I was broke. That's yeah. the story. Thank you. Give last me a round year. of applause. So to the next person. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> now, short, short stories. Short, short. So let's, let's. Okay. Short, short story. Like, give it in 15 seconds. Your name? 15 seconds. Yes. If you cannot do 15 seconds, please go have your seat. <laughs> if you cannot do 15 seconds, you can go have your seat. All right, let's do it. Hello, my name is Dr. Shodia. I say data analytics because I just wanted to do something while I was serving. So I'm not just going to PPA and coming back. Amazing, amazing. Look Thank at that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Victor. I'm a medical laboratory scientist. So I started my journey in data science because I wanted to be able to use the knowledge in predicting novel therapeutic measures for treating chronic diseases. Amazing. Thank amazing. Thank you so Love much. Let me hear you. Hello, everyone. My name is Olabi Singh. I studied animal production. I, I, was, I did AHR. I was just good at every. I was just getting things in different fields and I did not know where to settle. So a friend wow. said, data analysis sounds like you. And then I started, I got into it. And then you are here. Wow. Please give her a round of applause. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. That's interesting. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Oinda Mola Victor. I'm a data engineer and I work for Rack Center. It's a data center. And um, the reason why I entered data engineering, I'm talking to someone that's migrated from cybersecurity to web dev to now going to cloud engineering, it's now going to data engineering. Amazing. So there's well, a lot of things just to try out. So Amazing. basically, let me think, just be, um, have that tenacity to finally tenacity, do what you want. That's the do. world. Please give him a round of tenacity, applause. Tenacity, yeah. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Enopo Emi. So I'm a machine learning engineer. What got me into machine learning in the first place was my boss challenged me that I should create a model. His boss challenged him. Give him a round of applause. That's it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, hi, my name is Ms. Soma. I'm a programs manager for Edwidge Academy. I want to give shout outs to people here. Give to Arieta, Koya, Elisha. I like that. Uh, Kenny, Adela, thank you, thank you, thank you. Abu, thank you so much for bringing me here. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to hear from you very quickly. And remember, 10 seconds. Okay, good morning. Um, I hope to see Omo Balanli. All right, I'm very, very, very new into data analysis. I'm just three weeks into data analysis. Wow. Welcome. It's amazing. That's the good start. Thank you. Hey, um, my name is Paul. I work as a data analyst at Porsche. I just want to say this because that um, I want to say that if you're coming into data analysis, the major reason why I got the job was because um, earlier this year, uh, Promise also organized a data challenge. I was like, okay, we want to do professionals who can clean data. So I participated. And one of the reasons was because. <laughs> so, all I'm saying is please belong to a community if you're coming into the town. Thank you very much. Give him a round of applause. Belong to a community. That's a word. Good morning. So, my name is Wang Stephanie, and I studied electrical and electronics engineering. So, I started data science because I was looking for how can I, how can I use a tech field to implement the renewable energy industry. Wow. So I just want to say that whichever industry that you are, you don't have to leave that industry. You can use that Perfect. skill. Perfect. That is it. Transferable skills. You learn technical and you apply it to whatever industry. Thank you. All right. My name is Adibai Olatunde. I'm a sport data analyst and I work for the International Investment Federation. Uh, my story is simple. It's about how friendship can help you to be resilient. Wow. 
when you are learning. Thank you. Love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> I like that. Please give them a round of applause. You know, I tell you, the energy on this stage area is amazing. And for them to come out to give this talk, I think it's really amazing. Please give them a round of applause once again. Thank you Thank for you. coming out. So now we have our panelists in-house. And we're going to be going into the panel session now. And I tell you guys, this is a time when you want to take all the notes. You want to ask the questions because it's going to be an amazing time. So we have our panelists. We have Mayo Oshin. We have Dumebi Okechweme. And then we have Winfred Kumera. So we're going to read the bow very quickly. Just the first line, uh, the first paragraph of the bow. I think they are here, if you don't mind. Right, so that we can get straight into it. So let's meet Mayo Oshin. Mayo is widely recognized as an expert and consultant in building AI chatbots. He trained as an expertise data and early incubator to the Lang Chan AI, and his thought leadership on AI has reached and impacted over 4.5 million leaders and engineers so far. Mayor is also the founder and the CEO of Sienna Analytics, an AI training and consulting company that has worked with various major institutions and senior leadership at Evercore, BCG, University of Pennsylvania, PwC, and more. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Mayo as he comes on the panel. Thank you, Mayo. Now let's meet Dumebi. Dr. Dumebi is the founder and chief data scientist at EasyFin, an AI driver-enabled embedded intelligence technology startup. He was the chief data officer at Kobo 360, a Y Combinator alumni, where he oversaw the design and implementation of all BI and AI-related systems of the Kobo 360 e-logistics platform. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Dr. Dumebi. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes on stage. Next, we have Winifred Umera. Winifred is before she was, um, she's the current senior manager of Total Quality Management. And she has also held many other positions in customer service, retail sales, franchise, and stakeholder management. Notably, she has pursued many professional development opportunities to enhance her skills and knowledge. And among her many accomplishments, she has completed a general management training program at Harvard University. And she has fortified her strategic thinking and decision-making abilities. Winifred has received numerous accolades for her contribution to the industry. Her exceptional leadership skills and ability to inspire teams has been has resulted in significant improvements in operational efficiency and also customer experience. Let us welcome Winifred Umera. Welcome, Winifred. Please give welcome. her a round of applause as she comes on stage. And then we have Raphael Yemiton in the building. Raphael Yemiton, PhD, is a highly accomplished professional with a Doctor of Philosophy degree in statistics. He is widely recognized as a chartered statistician and chartered scientist, and he possesses extensive expertise in advanced analytics, machine learning and AI, digital strategy, robotics process improvement, and digital transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Dr. Raphael. A round of applause, guys. Keep A round it of up. applause. Amazing. Thank you so much. Too excited to have you. Thank you so much once again. Uh, we're so excited to have you join us today. Uh, it's it's going to be a conversation, right? Uh, and I know that you are experts. So, um, and I know that the audience definitely are going to gain a lot from this conversation. So, as much as possible, pour it all out. <laughs> Pour it all out to us, right? So I have some, you know, few questions here, and we're going to do this, I uh, think, just for about um, 40 minutes thereabout, or let's say 35 minutes. So our time our starts now. So by the top of our hour, we should be done. So I'll just read what this expert or panel session is all about, so you can 
But watch out for the keywords even as our panelists speak. Maximizing business value in the data-driven era. Insights from industry experts. So these are industry experts. Now, in today's data-driven world, businesses have an unprecedented opportunity to leverage data to unlock valuable insights, drive strategic decision-making, and gain a competitive hedge. The sheer volume of data generated globally each day is staggering, with approximately 2.5 million terabytes created daily. However, the true value lies in the ability to extract meaningful insights from this data and translate them into actionable strategies. This panel session will provide valuable insight from industry experts on how businesses can extract maximum value from their data-driven initiative. At the end of this session, participants will have, I will leave with a comprehensive understanding of the importance of data-driven decision-making, real-world example of businesses that have successfully leveraged data for competitive advantage, real-world example of use cases that can drive competitive advantage, strategies for building a data-driven culture within their organization, insights into the challenges and pitfalls to avoid when embarking on data-driven transformation, and then knowledge of emerging trends and technologies that can enhance data-driven strategies. So I'm going to start with the questions, and you know, quite a number of them, but I mean, lovely, lovely questions here. So I'm going to start with Dr. Dumebi. Now, Dr. Dumebi, I know you are a man of many experience and, you know, would like to know, what would you say are the key drivers, you know, behind the shift towards data-driven decision-making in businesses? What, what are the things that drive it? Yeah, so in my opinion, businesses started to realize that they had a lot of data. I remember one company I used to work for, um, when before they, they hired me, they said that they were disappointed that their customers are using the business data better than they are. And they could see very quickly that those customers were actually generating significant revenue and value from their own data. So I think people start realizing very quickly, you know what, th this can be monetized. This can be converted into intelligence. It can convert into decision-making, turn into strategy, turn into value. And, um, and then of course, people like all of, us, all of you here um, have all the skills and capabilities and businesses start realizing, great, I can bring in these talents um, they're in abundance and therefore they can come in, they can, they can help me be more data competent and they can help me leverage that data to great, you know, provide value for, for my business. And, and then sort of, that was a match made in, in heaven. Um, technology infrastructure become, became cheaper, became easier to implement, uh, resources became cheaper, easy to uh, implement. And, um, more and more businesses were generating more examples of how you can value use data in significant ways and then businesses sort of started following suit and then of course uh nowadays um companies like generative ai has sort of taken a huge front line and all businesses can see very clearly the massive value that it can generate and because they can see where data can be used they're now realizing that it's even more important to get all of that uh, housekeeping and data infrastructure ready for them to really value the data. So it's all, you know, it's, it's, I, guess, I guess if I was to summarize, businesses could now see more clearly the linear relationship between data and value. And that sort of got things going. Amazing. Wow. Thank you so much. Businesses can now see the linear relationship between data and value. Please give Dr. Dimebi a round of applause. Thank you so much. So I'm going to come to uh, Fred, and this question, you know, is, is I think is an important question on how can organizations foster a data-driven culture, you know, from top to bottom, you know, how, how exactly can, can they do that? Okay, um, good morning once again, everybody. Um, first of all, I must say thank you to the organizers and everyone and for having me here. Um, I'm sure by the time you, read, you saw or heard our profiles, you could tell that I was the only one who wasn't so, wasn't a data scientist per se, but <laughs> someone who consumes data uh, that much because by my level as a total quality senior manager, 
uh, we use data a lot. So thank you um, again for bringing me. And if there's anybody here who is not a data scientist, I am here for you. I represent that class of people that consume data. So how can organizations, repeat that again, how can yeah, organizations so foster a data-driven culture? Culture. Yes. I, I'll tell you a story. Uh, it, it, it didn't come to me naturally. So I grew, I grew by the ranks you know, in MTN Nigeria. I remember that those days when, we have a, a, when I have a problem, I would always state the problem, go to my boss, and I tell him oh, we have a problem. And then she would ask, so what's the solution? And I would give a solution, and I would you know, profess some solutions. Then she would now ask me, so is there any data behind your solution? She's, oh, she was always saying that I make decisions by the rule of thumb. <laughs> so I learned, I learned, I learned the hard way that, you know, you're safe using data. So for organizations, just the same kind of thing that my boss was doing uh, with me, that is the same thing that is becoming prevalent in every organization. And just like he said, you know, the first speaker said, you, you find out that there is so much data but because we feel that I've seen this problem before, you just tend to uh, make a decision and, uh, and then start going. I'll give you a typical example. When, you know, because we're a customer-driven organization, we were thinking that if we opened on Sundays, right? If we opened our stores on Sundays, customers will actually come in because we're thinking of people like everyone here who works nine to five. So we're saying that people are busy um, uh, and that um, most people will want to come to the store when, you know, on weekends, when they are not going to work. So we should open the stores on Sunday. We just made that decision without any data. No, nothing blind decision and we open started opening on Sundays morning till evening nobody would come in we open for weeks months <laughs> spanning two years and then after a week after a month people started trickling in but never enough to justify the amount of resources that we put up on Sundays never did we get that kind of that kind of, you know, return on that initiative, you know, to justify why we were opening on Mondays. On Sundays, all our stores will be open. The generators are up. The serve, everything is up. The cleaner is there. The, you know, water, everything, the staff is there. We're paying overtime because we didn't use data. But by the time we ran that operation for some time, everybody started saying, now we have enough data to make another decision. So that's how organizations actually foster. So you, you have to force it. You have to. People at the top have to start demanding that we have statistics or we have data to be able to make informed decisions. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. There must be that clear picture of why we need data, uh, and that will help drive culture. Thank you so much for sharing. Now I'm going to come to Dr. Raphael with this question. You know, you, you are a chartered statistician, a chartered scientist. And this question here says that what are the common challenges that organizations face when transitioning to a data-driven approach? And how can they address those challenges? What are the challenges they face and how can they address those challenges? Okay. Um, the challenges they face are largely as a result of getting into um, making the decision to, to um, become data-driven without necessarily putting the actions that are required to do it. Um, you have organizations say things like that, and then they don't put structures in place. They just appoint someone to say, now you are a data champion, and that's all. And um, for a data-driven organization, there are, there are um, things that you need to put in place. So for example, just like you have your organization structure, where you have the CEO down to the cleaners and everybody, when it comes to data, there is also a structure. 
Um, there are those who will take you know, strategic actions um, when you do your analysis and the result comes out. Um, someone is going to make a business decision based on that result, right? So that's the strategic person. There is someone who will review the work that you have done, right? That's more or less a tactical person. Then you doing the work is more operational. So if you look at it using that three-layer um, structure, you realize that you can actually do a lot in terms of how you can address the common pitfalls. Um, data quality is the major one. And data quality can easily be addressed with things like data governance, right? Um, but having data governance um, framework or policy in place is just a means to an end. That policy needs to be operationalized. So for example, you have made a decision within your business that the way you will write dates, and I like to use this example a lot, is day, month, year, right? Which means nobody within the organization should ever write date in any other format. Month, day, year, year, day, month. That is the data quality issue, as simple as it is. Because there are situations where you want to say um, 10th of May, and then someone writes 5th of October then that becomes a data quality issue. So as granular and as simple as that, you need to ensure right, that you follow the steps. Um, and one of the other components, um, apart from putting that structure in place, um, is also ensure a management commitment. Anything you do around you know, establishing a data-driven business right, must have you know, management commitment. And then that's, those are the guys who would actually make the final decision on your data. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Management commitments, having a structure, you know, I mean, that's amazing. Now let's go into AI a bit. We have Mayo here. And Mayo, this question is for you. It says that generative AI has shown great promise. How can businesses effectively incorporate generative AI into their strategies to enhance business efficiencies? Okay. Uh, so in the early periods when I was working with Langchain, um, one of the things we noticed was that a lot of companies uh, kind of jumped on the AI wave, mostly also formal, so the fear of missing out. Uh, and when I started working with these companies, we realized quickly that they don't have an AI issue, they actually have a data issue. Right? So for a lot of companies, the first thing they need to understand is that AI machine learning data, it's all in the same realm. So you can't just jump straight to AI if your data infrastructure is off, which is kind of what all the other panelists have talked about. You need to address your data infrastructure, the quality of your data, the way you structure your data, the way you update your data. Um, the quality needs to be high because all the AI is, AI is just, you know, it's using a large language model to train on data. So if the data is off, then what the model is going to uh, output is, is going to be off too. Uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that a lot of businesses don't have complete stakeholder buying. So what do I mean? So ironically, in my experience, the biggest um, blocker or the, the biggest enemy of progress, unfortunately, is the CTO of most companies. So why is that? And why I think about it, it makes sense, right? That, that's not what they were trained in. They were probably trained in, you know, traditional, Azure, SQL, that kind of stuff. So now this AI thing to them is, is a threat. So I come in, consultant, hey, we want to revamp, we want to da-da-da. The guy is shaking because he's like, ah, are you going to replace me? So there needs to be complete buying because usually it's the CEOs who go to all these conferences and they see what... That contemporary co uh, companies in the industry are doing abroad and they're like okay let's do it but your CTO may not buy in to it your existing data analyst too might be a bit scared are you trying to automate me away so everyone needs to um there, there needs it's a cultural shift it's not just uh you're not just bringing in this technology and everyone is just going to buy in. so that's the second thing um, there needs to be a clear understanding of the data sources that the company is working with um, and how that um, integrates with AI. So I'll give you an example. So we've worked with, uh, 
like uh, the pharmaceutical pharmaceutical company. They have a ton of um, information about the drugs they have, and it's stored in their database, right? So it's very clear where we're getting the data from, right? That you can then use to train the, the AI model and then generate the result you're looking for. But if you are not clear, for example, so you just say something like, "Okay, we want you know the ability to um, you know ask questions about." Um, the performance of our finances, right? But you don't have a clear route to pull that data out. You don't have APIs. You don't have, um, you know, a, a clear store of that, those documents or that data. Then again, yeah, yeah, it, it makes life. So again, it's going back to the whole data structure, uh, infrastructure being in place. Uh, once all of that's kind of there, then the next thing is, you know, what, um, how the company wants to. Uh, basically implement the solution. What, what tools they want to use? There are a lot of tools out there, obviously. I'm biased towards Langchain because I was early there. But there, there are other tools out there that uh, are frameworks that a company can use to uh, basically begin this process of, you know, training, uh, you know, training, creating their own chat GPT, but for their own data, effectively. Um, you have uh, frameworks like Langchain. You have models like OpenAI, Anthropic. Um, and so on. Um, you have uh, what's known as vector, vector stores, which help you to perform a similarity search on your documents. There are a ton of enterprise solutions there. So it's about then choosing which ones of those tools kind of suits the company's goals. Um, and then there's, and then there's a decision, the architectural decision of, do we want to uh, use a model off the shelf or do we want to basically train, uh, do a fine tuning of, the, of a model uh, in that case, you probably uh, are thinking more about privacy. You know, you don't want to put your data out there to open AI, maybe you're afraid that they might use it for their own training. So then you are dealing with on-prem um, deployments of your own model. So these are all the kind of decisions that a company has to make, obviously hiring the right talents and so on and so forth. So, Amazing. Thank you so much, Mayo. Thank you. I mean, that's, that's a masterclass on generative AI for businesses. Thank you so much. And I'm still going to come back to you. But before then, let me ask Dr. Demebi this very important question. You've talked about our steps towards data-driven uh, businesses. Now, this question says, how can businesses effectively measure the success of their data-driven initiative? You know, how can we really measure it? Is there, is there a way to do that? Uh, yes. So that, that's actually quite difficult for businesses to do because that at the moment that they can start really measuring the performance of their data-driven strategy is when you know the business is solid. To get there, um, the business, as um, Mawa mentioned, needs to be aligned. You know, CTO needs to be on board, the, his team needs to be on board, and the transformation needs to be done. Most businesses fail deploying data-driven strategy because they don't have commitment from the team. So that's, that's key. Um, once the operations of the business is aligned and you're able to measure output, then you're there. So a good example is um, I, I am a financial service company and I'm now using data to make lending decisions. Um, before my market people go out there, they'll meet people, they'll be selling loans. Um, now they're going through a, a website, they're going through an app, they're going through an agent with, an, with a tablet and they collect information to onboard the customer. Before, subjective, you're wearing a nice dress, you're wearing a nice suit, you're good for loan. Now, data-driven, you're using bank statements, you're using credit bureau information, and you're making decisions as quickly. What you then do is see the output. The output will be, in, for this example, will be array rates. How many of these people are paying us back on time? Now, why that is difficult is because you, that information needs to be precise. You know? So what that means is, if you are using data now, you cannot have any non-data elements influencing the outcome. It means that these customers went through this process and got there. Not that someone intercepted that data, manipulated it, or someone spoke to the customer, coached them on what to say. Or, you know, there, there's a lot of ways you can pollute the process or the operations. And therefore, the outcome you see is inaccurate. And then you might say, oh, it's not working, or something has gone wrong. So to uh, the, uh, the answer to the question is that you need to have the measurement KPIs and metrics to observe the outcomes, 
but the most important thing is to make sure that the operations is precise. The operations is purely data-led. The operation is not polluted by any other influence. And man, I'd say that that's where most companies struggle. Um, you have to understand that if you've been doing business a certain way for a very long time, your people have been doing certain business a certain way a very long time, it is very difficult to say, guy, let's step back. Let that's a machine do it. Very, 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 very difficult. Um, so you will always see leaks. But in my opinion, suffice the leadership is committed. Suffice um, the, the, the company wants to achieve those outcomes. It's all about patience and precision. It may not happen initially or immediately. It will happen over time. But as long as the improvements are there and progress is made, then you, companies will get there. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. I know our time is fast spent, but I'm going to quickly ask this Dr. Raphael, and this is a question around challenges that you, you, are, you are a chartered statistician, you're a consultant. Uh, what would you say are the common challenges that you know, organizations face when they are transitioning into becoming a data-driven organization? And your experience, how can they address these challenges? Okay. Um, I think I'll pick it from um, how they can address these challenges. Um, Likely, what they need to do first is set an objective. Um, remember, we talk about the structure. Um, the structure is not a structure if there is no objective they're going to drive, right? So there needs to be an objective, and then um, they then need to democratize data within the business, and then take um, what we call um, the citizen development, um, so that everyone within the business, right, um, is upskilled to, to know how to get around the use of data. And um, in fact, there are new ideas coming up on how to even make that more efficient. Um, I think that's the idea around edge computing. Um, edge computing is helping you to process your data as close to the user as possible. So which means if you're able to process data as close to customers, as, as, to the user as close as possible, then the person is able to make informed decision. And if every user or every um, um, staff of your organization can make business decision, immediately they are processing their data, then imagine how that will trickle down to becoming a data-driven business. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much. And the last question for Winfred is a question around, you've talked about stakeholders. Now, in your experience, how can one, especially we have a lot of data scientists, data analysts here, how can they convince a critical stakeholder? So maybe the CEO, you know, the CTO, just like, you know, Amayo said, how can they really convince them to take on data for driving decisions in their organization? Okay, thanks again. I think that, that, that is honestly very easy uh, in today's world. You know, like Mario and Rafael has said, the results. So, if I hear do maybe before they would have to hire marketers, uh, put them in a car blindly, they see me dressed the way I'm dressed, and they think I can actually take up a loan of uh, 10 million. Uh, because I am dressed 10 million, you get what I'm saying? So they give me a loan of 10 million and unfortunately I'm not able to pay them back because they are not looking at my bank history. They are not seeing that I have never even had a 1 million dollar in my account before, as much as I dress a million dollar. So with that, I'm sure that today they make better decisions in terms of the kind of people that they give loans because they are looking at your historical uh, transactions. So it, it's very easy. This whole data thing is honestly very interesting. Um, and I dare say that it's been there ever since. It's just that people have never really turned the, the even up to the native doctors, um, I must say, <laughs> honestly. So I'm a bit of a storyteller, so I must tell this story. Uh, when we were much younger, my cousin used to tell us a story about uh, native doctors. 
And I didn't understand that he was trying to tell us that native doctors actually use data to do what they're doing. It was after March I found out that that's what he was trying to say, that it's all about using data and psychology. Because he told us a very funny story then that there was a woman who went to a native doctor and said to the native doctor that her business wasn't doing well because her, her competition was actually using jazz, you know, using juju. And the native doctor said, yes, she must. He said, because when she comes out, nobody buys her food, but they buy her competition's food, finish everybody. So the man said, oh, good. So where is this your shop? He said, it's uh, around the, they, they, they have a building complex, a string of building complex. And so the, it's the workers that buy the things. So it's okay. When does your competition come out? So the competition, the lady comes out by say 6, 6 a.m. When do you come out? She comes out by 8 a.m. So before she comes out, the workers that have gathered for the day, they had finished eating. So when she comes out, nobody's hungry anymore and nobody's gonna buy. So the native doctor says, no problem got some leaves, did some things, made some chance, and then told her, you must be there by 5.45 a.m. every morning. And by 5.45 a.m. every morning, she was there. And before her competition comes, the workers has finished her food. So you see the data worked, huh? The juju works, huh? So, um, 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 uh, so just when you ask me, how would competition? It's when you see results. And this is just a very clear case. This woman will continue going back to that native doctor. Unfortunately, the native doctor is just using statistics. And I dare say that today, if native doctors know the power in, in statistics and in data, they would even become better native doctors than what they were doing. I mean, so, thank you so much. I mean, that's, that's a fantastic one. Wow, our time is fast spent. But well, really, we want to thank you. I mean, it's, it's been an amazing time. Okay, yes, let's hear from Dr. Raphael on that. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Winifred, for that. And I want to use that to also call our attention to some things. Um, when you do data, um, you are like a software engineer, like a software developer. All the things that they do in the software development life cycle also applies to you. What the native doctor has done is requirement graduate right? Understand uh, the objective, the scope of work, and all of those things. The problem we data people have is that we jump into the data when they say forecast revenue. You just jump into it. Why am I forecasting revenue? You need to re collect that requirement, and that is key, right, to solving the problem. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Honestly, I want to hear from Dr. To maybe if you have anything on, on this conversation around, you know, managing competition, the challenges using data. I, I completely agree. I think um, sometimes, you know, particularly a lot of us here, you understand data and you look for the answer in the data. And sometimes the answers are not in the data. They are elsewhere. Um, a good example is, and I'll, I'll go back, I always go back to learn examples, is you might see that people are defaulting all of a sudden after New Year, after Christmas. And you just think, oh, these are all bad customers. These are bad customers. They're all defaulting. Uh, but then you then you have to take into consideration what else is happening, macroeconomic var var variables. In this case, it's Christmas. They all go out, they all spend money, they all celebrate, they overspend, and they were not prepared for the loan. So... On the, the data is there, it says they're good borrowers, says they have good credit history. Why did they default in this time? It's because you need to take consideration of other things. So I think it's important to note that sometimes you do need to be more involved with the customer than necessarily with just the data. Understand their circumstances and their considerations and context around what they're doing. And that helps a lot. It's a
called data science because there is a lot of research involved beyond the data itself. So you have to, don't be, trust me on this. I know it may seem difficult sometimes. You have to get out of the laptops, get out of the, of the, the numbers and look at the customer directly and, and understand them. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I'm going to, I to hear from Mayo. I know coming from the AI perspective, Mayo, how would you say organizations right, can also you know, mitigate risk Right, and make the most of their data to drive competitive advantage, you know, from a generative AI perspective. Yeah, so when you say mitigate risk, I'm thinking more in terms of, you know, when, when they do decide to use it, preventing issues like, uh, you know, data leakage, for exactly. example. Yeah. Um, so again, you know, back to the structuring issue, there's, there's the choice of deploying your own model Right? You don't have to use the popular ones out there. Um, obviously, you would need your own uh, machine learning operations team and your own pipeline. But the advantage of that is that you have your own in-house model trained on your own data. Um, so there's no privacy leak in that case. Um, other risks would be in terms of um, internal stakeholders that you don't want to access certain types of data. So maybe you only want certain executives to have access to certain types of data you would need to build a pipeline to address those, those things as well. Um, I think for, for most companies at this point, the risk for them is it's mostly um, their fear is just privacy. They, they've accumulated a lot of proprietary data over many years, and their fear is uh, if we go into this thing, would, we, would it leak? Right. So I think those are the main things that... Um, uh, companies think about, but for people who are in-house um, developing the solutions for the company, they need to obviously do the best uh, best practice development security, you know, security measures in terms of uh, you know proper uh, credentials and author authorization and stuff like that. Amazing, amazing! Thank you so much. I'm sure we've had a fantastic time at this panel session. So you want to give our panelists another round of applause. Amazing. Thank you so much. So we've come to the end of the panel session, but we don't want you to go until we give you, uh, so we have some plaques that we just love to give to you. So uh, let's do that very quickly. Sorry. If you can clap, you can do that better, please. <laughs> we've had a great time, you know. So I'm going to start with uh, Winfred. Uh, Winfred, thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the organizers, we want to present this uh, award to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yes, yeah, so you can be done. Yeah, thank you so much. All right. So we have this for uh, Dr. Raphael. Please give Winfred a round of applause as she steps. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on board. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Dumibi, thank you so much for coming. It's always lovely hearing you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have this for you. Thank you. All right, Mayo. Thank you so much, Mayo. It was great hearing you on those uh, lovely talks. Thank you so much. All right, please give our panelists another round of applause. I mean, what a wonderful session we've just had. Thank you so much. All right, so now we'll be going to another expert session, right? And I know that we had a lot, we've learned a lot, right? Just hearing our panelists share, right? And if I, I mean, for me, I feel like that panel session should not end, but we had to. I know, I know. <laughs> you know, so... Now, the expert session is on from seed to scale. Remember that most of us already have exchanged contacts during speed dating. So we've met somebody. Now, that business idea that you've you know, generated by just that, those conversations, how can you move them into startup ideas, get a seed, which is like financial investment, and then how can you scale, right? And we're going to talk about... Uh, our, our expert session speaker is going to be talking about building a successful AI startup. Anyone in AI space here or anyone who would love to get into AI with a show of hand? Can we see them? Okay, so we have a lot of them. All right. So 
meet Fatima Tamba Gang. Yeah. So Fatima is the head of developer relations, startup, and VC for Africa at NVIDIA. She's driving momentum with external African developer communities and equipping them with the tools and knowledge needed to create innovative AI solutions. NVIDIA, a global technology leader headquartered in San Francisco and ranked among the top 10 biggest companies in the world, is leading the AI revolution with its groundbreaking work in AI and GPU that powers everything from chat GPT to African innovation. Before NVIDIA, Fatima managed a global accelerator program where she worked closely with dozens of high-growth startups, helping them scale their operations through partnership across several African markets. I experienced an expressive as led her to speak on several platforms, including BBC Africa, Forbes, um, Copangan Fintech Week, where she shares her insights on startup, venture capitals, and developer relations. Now, Fatima is the head of developer startups and VC ecosystem for Africa and Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Fatima, Fatima. as she comes on stage. With a round of applause, please. Welcome, Fatima. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Super nice to be here. My name is Fatima. We'll just do some icebreakers while we wait for the slides to um, load. Uh, the first question that I have for the audience is, does anyone know the largest tech acquisition in Africa? If you know it, just feel free to raise your hand and just you know shout out an answer. There's a gentle man at the back, yes. Sorry? InstaDeep, and that is absolutely correct. Uh, so I think there tends to be um, an understanding that when it comes to Africa, FinTech is what's burgeoning, which is true. People tend to think of Flutterwave and Paystack, but actually the largest tech acquisition on the continent is InstaDeep. InstaDeep is an AI startup that was founded in 2016, based in Tunisia. And they were acquired earlier this year for $700 million and they focus on AI, specifically around B2B solution. So I think what this shows is that, you know, the AI boom that's happening is definitely not a hype and it's here to stay. Um, they've been in the field for the past decade. But I think the slides are now up, so we'll just quickly go through it um, so that we can spend more time during questions. Uh, next slide, please. Is there a clicker or? Yeah, so just next slide. Fantastic, we can skip through that. So I'll just quickly, you know, ask the audience what they think when they think about NVIDIA, because that tends to be helpful to understand uh, what to fill in and so forth. So if anyone can, you know, uh, raise their hands and share what they think about when they think about NVIDIA, that would be great. And in the meantime, if the um, slides can be slowed down, that would be fantastic. I don't know if anyone from the team can help with that. But yeah, please go ahead. Gaming, fantastic, that's very true. Any other answers? Video editing, fantastic. Anyone else? Graphics, great. Anyone else? AI chips, AI chips, fantastic. So NVIDIA was born in 1993, and it was known as a gaming um, company. So it created a graphics card called GPUs, which stands for General Processing Units. Um, and then in 2012, a researcher realized that you can use the same graphic cards to do parallel processing. And then from there, the NVIDIA AI chips uh, were kind of thrusted into the mainstream. Most recently, when ChatGPT you know, was born, a lot of people um, understood NVIDIA for their actual chips. Today, NVIDIA is the seventh largest company in the world. Um, it became a trillion dollar company just a few months ago, mainly due to the entire generative AI boom. 84% of AI infrastructure is built on NVIDIA. So whether it's TikTok, whether it's Netflix, Amazon, Uber algorithms, NVIDIA tends to build it. And more than that, we do full stack. So we do everything from chips to software, and then also to frameworks, and most importantly, solution development kits. And essentially what that does is it allows developers 
to have frameworks so that building AI becomes less intimidating and less daunting. So think of Wix, but for AI, or Pixel back in the day, which was like a social media platform, but for AI, essentially. Um, so yeah, if we can have the next slide, that would be fantastic. Awesome. So as I was mentioning earlier, these are some of NVIDIA's uh, AI customers. We work with every single Fortune 500 in the world, whether it's in fintech, whether it's in uh, automotive industry, energy, social media, um, and you name it. We power the likes of AWS, Microsoft, and Oracle when it comes to access to cloud computing. When it comes to ChatGPT, uh, more uh, specifically, if you lift the hood, they have over tens of thousands of NVIDIA chips to run the fantastic work that they do. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, every single business needs uh, artificial intelligence. There's so many ways that you can use it, right? You could use it when it comes to customer service, analytics, finance, radiology, and so forth. And more specifically in the African context, you know, we have a lot of mobile agents on the ground. Um, and just imagine how much more efficient they can be if they utilize artificial intelligence. And I think most of us use AI every single day without realizing it. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. So when it comes to Africa, people don't tend to think that there's a lot going on, but there actually is, right? So just a few months ago, there's a conference called Indaba, um, and they gather over 800 experts from 32 countries once a year across the continent. This year it was in Ghana, the year before that it was in Tunisia, and the editions before were in Kenya and South Africa. So hopefully they'll come to Nigeria one day. Um, there are over 2,400 AI organizations on the continent. Um, most of them tend to sit in the northern part of Africa, so your Tunisia's, your Algeria's, your Morocco, and a lot of them also sit in the southern part. However, there is a war, and Nigeria isn't doing too well, right? So the Jollof of War is one thing, but when it comes to the AI war, right now what we're actually seeing is Ghana is leading. Ghana is leading, Tunisia, a country, with a population of five million people is leading. And you know we don't understand uh, why that is. Um, and I'm actually here in my personal capacity, right? Like it was super important for me to come today and you know engage with the builders and try to understand because Nigeria has a population of 200 million. You can't talk about Africa and not talk about Nigeria, right? So we're super excited to see what people are building and just encourage people to go into the field of AI. There tends to be a misconception that you need to have a degree in AI or a PhD or a master's degree. I have an economics degree. I barely know how to code in Python, right? But we have solution development kits and that essentially allows you to do the frameworks. So yeah, I definitely want to encourage people, you know, to go into the field. Yes, it takes time. Yes, you need to be more patient, but the outcome is definitely uh, worth it. And most of our AI developers that we work with in the ecosystem are self-taught. Next slide, please. So now I'll talk a little bit more about our inception program. So our inception program is essentially an ecosystem. It's not an accelerator. Um, it's not an incubator. It's essentially just an ecosystem where we work with different startups across different scales. So we worked with the likes of OpenAI. We worked with the likes of InstaDeep. And we also work with developers who have like two developers and work in a garage as well. And what we do is we support them in building. That's what we're strong at and we support them specifically technically. Once we've supported them technically and they have a working application into the field, we can then go to market with them. And going to market looks like helping them get access to venture capital, helping them get access to media and so forth. But the first thing and most important thing is what are you building, how are you building it and why are you building it? So if you could go to the next slide, that would be fantastic. So yeah, as I mentioned, these figures need some updating because today we have over 15,000. Uh, the startups in our ecosystem have raised close to a trillion now, and we have over 100 countries. In Africa, we have about 19 countries represented, like mainly. Yeah, and then these are some of the key startups from the African ecosystem. And some of the use cases that we see typically come from healthcare, they come from agritech, 
and they also come from fintech. So Instadeep is up there. You have N Farmer from Ghana. You have Africa Health Holding Ghana, PharmaLine Ghana, Aerobotic South Africa, Protina Egypt, Veron South Africa, and Casper Profit South Africa. There's not one Nigerian startup on that slide. And by the time I'm here this time next year, I want that to change because Again, the numbers don't make sense. This is the largest population. Whenever you're in Nigeria, everyone always talks about the energy, the hustle, the gra gra, but we're not seeing it on our screen. So help me help you, you know? Awesome. So yeah, actually we do have some good news. There is a, there is a Nigerian on the screen. So the first two guys are Ghanaians, but the other guy is Nigerian. His name is Toby. I don't know if anyone have heard of him. Toby was born and raised in Nigeria, and he was a doctor. He left for the U.S., and then he went to work with AWS. And while working at AWS, he was a research scientist, and he recently started his own startup around health tech. And what he does is he does automatic speech recognition, but for African accents, specifically in Nigeria first. So accents for Igbo, Yoruba, Hausa, and so forth. So yeah. Give it up for Toby, uh, fantastic, fantastic guy. Hopefully this time next year we can get him here. We also have Techabal, right? Techabal has, you know, written about the work that NVIDIA has done a few times and also spotlighted Toby specifically. And in the photo at the bottom, we have Toby at our headquarters. And you can see here again, the work that Toby has done and then also the work of our fellow Ghanaians. But like I said, Ghana won, Nigeria zero, but let's change that uh, next year. So yeah, next slide, please. Next slide. Awesome. This is the most important slide. So what this slide essentially means is it's our app catalog. And what our app catalog essentially is, when we have startups that have gone through building, they've gone through validation of their ideas and their ideas are being used, we then upload it to this portal. When you go to this portal, you'll see everything from OpenAI to Netflix to a regular startup from Estonia. So it gives you access and visibility from analysts, from investors, and it's a great go-to marketing opportunity. Can we go to the next slide, please? Awesome. So these are a few of our VCs, and these are our first VCs. We now have six VCs on the continent, but these are our first two ones that we started with. As I mentioned, after we help you technically, we then help you go to market. This year, we've been able to help startups raise more than $19 million. In Kenya, we helped one raise 10.4. In Nigeria, undisclosed amount. The deal is about to be closed. In Ghana as well, the deal is underway. But essentially, what we are trying to do is we're trying to create generative AI, LLMs, um, and just general use AI use cases from the continent just to show that, you know, there's more uh, to the place than fintech. Because whenever you talk about Africa, it's always fintech, and that's fantastic and everything. We want to showcase that there is a diverse um, talent field, and there's also diverse applications coming from the continent. And you can't do that without money. Let's be serious. Next slide, please. So, yeah, one of our key success stories is InstaDeep. They've been part of our ecosystem since 2016. When they started their organization, they literally had $4,000. Come 2019, they raised a million. They spent about 200,000 with NVIDIA. And then a few years later, they raised to 43. And then earlier this year, they were acquired by a German company for 700 million. They have an office in London, San Francisco, Germany, and they have one in Tunisia, and they're opening up an office in Rwanda. They should be opening off an office in Nigeria, hopefully, right? But again, data is important, right? I mean, the title of this entire event is data, but when it comes to Nigeria, stakeholders aren't able to capture data. We're not able to understand how many AI developers are there or how many people are just interested in AI, right? So you don't necessarily need to go right away into it, but at least if interest is being shown and captured, that's great. And I think that's why events like this are fantastic because I think the team has done a really, really great job at showcasing what's possible. So the next slide, please. Intron Health, again, another successful story. So two weeks ago, I was in New York at the General Assembly. And the guy that we had next to us was Toby, showcasing the work that he was doing 
in front of dignitaries, in front of VCs and so forth. So I guess in this case, it's Nigeria one and Ghana zero. Um, next slide, please. Bright Skies, another fantastic solution. They are from Egypt. And again, when they started, they started self-taught, dispelling the myth that we need a master's to start. Can we go into another slide, please? And then we have Proteina. They're doing drug discovery, which is super cool. So what they tend to do is they create almost like Lego blocks that scientists can use to prototype what medicine would look like before medicine is being used. And I think what's super interesting with AI is you don't necessarily need to serve an African market only. So you start with Africa in mind, but you're able to expand globally. Most of these solutions are focused on international markets, which allows them to capture fields that startups in this ecosystem don't tend to also think about. Can we have the next slide, please? And then we have a South Africa initiative called Aerobotics, and they focus on farming. 70% of the arable land on, in the world comes from Africa. So we see a lot of use cases in farming as well. Next slide, please. So yeah, in summary, if you are a startup and you do want to join the ecosystem, definitely join it. And some of our do's and don'ts is we expect people to be proactive. We expect people to take the time and engage with the experience. And we expect people to build before wanting to go to market. And building is steep, I'll be honest with you. It can take anywhere from six months to 18 months. But once that is out of the way, then we definitely go into markets with our partners. And then can we have the next slide? This is just some of the work that we've done uh, over the years on the continent, uh, across Ghana, Nigeria, Egypt, Tunisia, and so forth. And my name is Fatima Tambajang, so feel free to find me on Twitter and just, you know, at me. Always happy to share resources and have conversations. Um, and then can we go to the next slide? Next slide, please. I'll leave this up here just for a minute. If you are interested in learning more about the program, feel free to scan the QR code and it will take you straight to information regarding it. If we don't have time, I'll share it with the team so they can also disseminate it via their communication channels. And then can we go to the next slide? Awesome. So we have a present for Data uh, Fest Nigeria. So on behalf of GIFT, um, who's been a fantastic ally in the ecosystem, you know, I'm mainly here today because of him and the team. They've done fantastic online. Uh, we wanted to share some codes regarding our Deep Learning Institute. So our Deep Learning Institute is essentially a virtual ecosystem and a virtual platform that's used by developers worldwide. We have over 3 million developers on this ecosystem from guys that are sitting at JP Morgan to guys that are sitting at InstaDeep and so forth. Typically, these courses cost anywhere from 90 to $500. And today there's 0, 0.00. From today going on to the next two weeks, mainly due to our engagement with Data uh, Fest Nigeria. So what I will do is I'll just let the QR code up there and then I'll let Gift come up and then also just share uh, some of his insights as he's also um, been in the field of our work. Hi everyone, so I heard it's not working, right? Yeah, so we'll be sending this if we have a Discord channel. So if you are interested, please, we'll share the Discord channel probably on maybe LinkedIn and we'll figure out that. Please, I wanted to scan the QR code if you are in the data science, machine learning, deep learning space. Yeah, so I wanted to scan the QR code, please. Yeah, please, thank you. Awesome. And the QR code is great, right? It helps us also capture um, data, understand what's happening in Nigeria, understand what are the interests of developers here so that we can fine tune our model of engagement and so forth. No pun intended. So I want to wrap up quickly so that we can spend as much time on Q&As and getting into what is rhetoric and what is reality when it comes to AI. So if you have a question, feel free to, you know, uh, shoot your hands up and it would be great if anyone could maybe share a mic with those asking questions so that it can be more audible. So yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for your time. And once again, thank you to the organizing team and all the volunteers who've you know, done such a fantastic job at putting everything together. So yeah, over to the audience.
Don't worry, that's fine. Well, thank you so much. No worries. We don't have time for questions today, but like I said, um, feel free to share them on the Discord cord, and I'm sure the team will get them back to me. So yeah, thank you as well to the host. Thank you so much. Plug for you. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Yeah. Please, a round of applause for Fatima as she goes to take her seat. Amazing. I'm sure we're all having a great time, right? We're having a great time. And without further ado, we'll move into the next session, which is going to be very engaging, I believe, right? It's the presentation by those who have participated in the hackathon. So we have five teams. Yeah, I heard who. Yeah, you can make noise for them. Yeah, you can. <laughs> I mean, these guys have gone through a thorough data ton, right? And now they've emerged as top five. And they'll be sharing with us right, um, right here. Now, let me just give you a brief about the data ton, which is designed to provide an avenue for students, for enthusiasts, for new entrants, as well as professionals in the data space of analytics, data engineering, data science, machine learning, or local development to challenge themselves to take up projects and data to solve real-world scenario-based problems, build and grow their portfolio, and create an avenue for networking and working with fellow data professionals. Now, we have the teams and we have our judges. So I'm going to present the names of the judges, and then uh, if I would tell us about the teams, in a moment. Now, some of the judges are here on premise. Some are connected live. So they'll be listening to the uh, presentations from the Akaton uh, team, right? So please, you want to make sure that within four minutes, you can pitch your idea, present your idea, and then the judges will take note, right? Now, speaking about our judges, we have Andre Bryce, who is the founder of Willow Finch, right? Please, you can, yes, you can do that better. You can give a round of applause. They'll, he's, they'll be judging. We have Shin Ogunsonya, who is a team lead, data and business intelligence at Providence Bank PLC. No, you can do that better. A round of applause. You know, you are celebrating yourself by doing that. Then we have Ayodeji Adedayo Fanion, who is a senior data scientist at PwC UK. Yeah, you can, you can do that better. Then we have Jennifer Ebe, who is a data engineer at Stalin Bank. We have Gilbert Langat, who is a, data, a senior data scientist at Ezra, also one of our judges. And last but not the least, we have Fatai Sonny, who is a data analyst, Reliance Infosystem, also right here as a judge. Now let's meet our hackathon participant. So we have five teams that are here to present their solutions. And they'll be coming out one after the other to present their solutions. Um, we have Team Heat. We have the Dream Team. We have Team Vanguard. We have Data Hub. And we have Data Dynasty. We're going to start with Team Heat. Team Heat. Please, let's give them. Please, let's give them a round of applause. They will be presenting in four minutes. Uh, so we believe you'll do a quick one. Hello everyone, we are Team Hit and we'll be presenting our projects for the data zone. Starting with our data engineering project, the objective of this project was to design an ETL pipeline that extracts, transforms, and loads data into facts and dimension tables. Um, for some reason, this slide haven't come up yet, so I can't really show you our ERD diagram. But essentially, all the data comes from a primary source, which is the sensor data. So we have them connected through timestamp and sensor ID where applicable. All right. So moving on to our data analysis, so please, next, next. All right, how much do we produce? AG Resources has produced 14.33 million kilograms per meter square of crop between 2022 to 2023. We have um, an about 1.91 million kilograms per meter squared of crop monthly on average. And the crop we produce the most of is rice and the least is wheat. Next slide, please. Okay, revenue and crops. 
to, to find how much each crop produces revenue or is not profits, because we actually aren't given the production costs, nor are we giving the exact crop variety. So this is an estimate. We use the um, minimum retail price of these crops in the US. Barley is the most, is crop producing the most revenue, while corn is producing the least. Next slide, please. When to plant, all right. So here we have on this slide, you can actually The most yield for each of the farms. So it is the most efficient. And the yeast produces the least per farm. So we can say it's least. Next slide, please. Okay, elevation and region. On this chart, we've separated our locations into high elevation, low elevation, and medium elevation areas. We can see that the east and north have the most high elevation areas. The west and central have the most low elevation areas. Please, next. Okay, save that water. So this actually shows us the best irrigation method to use depending on elevation and water source. As we can see, for high elevation areas, using the drip method tends to be faster regardless of water source. But when dealing with low areas, as I mistakes, the flood method happens to be the fastest. Next slide, please. That chart, the previous chart was supposed to show you the different locations where AG resources plant. AG resources plants all over the world. But then we noticed some locations are actually on the ocean, probably an issue due to data recording. We also see that some of the locations are planting multiple crops, but some combinations are not ideal. For example, we have rice and wheat being planted on the same location. But rice requires a lot of water, while wheat would not necessarily survive. Please, next slide. Okay, weather and plants. For example, we can see tomato, which would not survive as temperatures below 10 degrees Celsius, being in the seedling stage while it is snowing. Next slide. Pests on the farm. This chart shows us um, which pest is most severe during what month. So we can see that fungi is more severe in March, May. Next slide. Okay, but this just shows us each crop and the pest that affects them the most. We can also see when the pest strikes. The pest actually happens to strike during the seedling. Okay, next slide, next slide. Let's quickly go. Next slide, next slide. Um, this is just a crop cultivation schedule showing the best time to plant. Next slide. So we have a three-year crop rotation plan that actually separates our specific crops by seasonal, um, this thing, the seasons where they grow. So from this, this allows the soil to maintain its fertility and reduces um, pest um, growth in these regions. Please, next slide. Um, the integrated pest management plan. This just shows us how we can manage pests. Um, next slide. Okay, next. Okay, so this is our expansion plan. So for expansion, we've selected the Western region and the Eastern region. Now in the Western region, we find out that the climate is particularly favorable to a large number of the crops cultivated by the organization. And we also discovered that, as we've previously said, the uh, efficiency in the land use is particularly higher. So per every...
for this. So I started off with crop profitability. I wanted to understand which crops are generating yields. So I had to go through the road of finding the total yields. And we found out that approximately 13 million kilograms per meter square is gotten from our crops. But how does this make sense to us exactly? What can we tell with 13? So I went on to do an average. And you can find out from the slide that on average, for every meter square of land you cultivate, you would get 6.83 kilograms of crops, which is, let's say, 7 kilograms, which is quite good, actually. But what if we're trying to check minimum and maximum? What if we want to know our minimum and maximum yield? So if you try to check this now, you see if we're doing really bad, if you check the chart over there, you see we have about 1 kilogram for every square meter of land, and that's quite bad. Then if you check maximum, you see 7, no, 12 kilograms, rather, which is actually quite good. So we know about our yields now. Let's see how the yields are distributed amongst the crop types. Checking that by the average, we see only just slight differences, but we see sugarcane and corn leading the charts. So with this, I think the trends of how our crops are being distributed. But what I want to see now is about the trends over the years. Are these starting years or starting months where we seem to be getting the most yields from our crops? We're looking to expand. We need to know how we can expand with an increase in profits. Making revenue is our very sole aim. So starting with, can we go back to the next slide, please? Go back to the previous slide. Go back to the previous. Yes, thank you. Starting with, you check, you, you check your trend line. Checking the trend line, we can see months, November, and other months I lighted in red, where we, made, where we had a dip in the average crop yields. So I wanted to understand why did we see a, a dip in this period. So I decided to check factors. And you can see factors such as our, our wind speed. So what I did was I picked a range. Checking online, you get 6.705 as the maximum wind speed. For this. So going to this, we now discover that during this period, there are some, the wind speed, when the wind speed was above this range, it coincides with that same period where we had minimum yields. Then I also checked, and we can also see some pest occurrence in March 2023. Then finally, I provided a general overview of the crop types there. Can we move to the next slide? Then I decided to go into the irrigation, irrigation and water resources to check on average how many minutes we spend in our water source, which is about 30. And then I provided some insights on the irrigation duration in years, and the water sources we have across this period. But what I want to take you to is the interesting part of this. Can we go to the next slide, please? On the next slide, thank you. Can you make that bold? OK, so the next slide is about regional profitability. We have about 753 agricultural locations, which is split between five regions, the north, west, south, and east. Having these agricultural locations, there are some of the factors that affect this. We want to pick a location, and to pick a location, one thing I want you to know that is your crops are important and some certain factors you need to know. So you need to consider light intensity in picking a location. If you're going to plant certain crops that require right. ample sunlight, you need to consider Time's that. Up. So what I did was I created a chart showing you the light intensity, and when it's Please give a round of applause. Thank you so much. What I would recommend is diversification All and right. crop rotation for this plant. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. And this is what I have. For thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You team. Um, we have our next team, Nick. Um, team Vanguard. Team Vanguard, can we have you on stage, please? Team Vanguard, let's have you. All right, please give them a round of applause as they come on. Thank you so much. So five minutes. Watch out for your time on the timer. Once it's time up, you have to stop. All right? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joseph, and here with me is Joke and Ibrahim Ibrahim. Together we are Team Vanguard and we are opportune to work with the Ag Resource um, Project. So before we continue, because of the projector, you can check the slides on your phone 
at bit.ly forward slash team hyphen vanguard v a n g u a r d and you can scan the code there to you know follow up thank you so next slide please so working with our resource two major problems were our concern expansion and strategic recommendations so what we ended up working with is improved pipeline predictive models and data driven recommendations next slide please now data engineering pipeline we worked on a simple etl process where we used a python script to pull data away from snowflakes using the snowflakes python library clean data get our facts and dimension tables and push those tables back to um, snowflakes next slide please looking at the overview of our data analysis project our resource had five regions 10 crops five different growth stages 14 million units total over the last one year and 2.5 million units in the harvest stage i'll be handing over to joker to take over for me thank you joseph so looking at our, profi um, our crop analysis, we discovered that rice has the highest yield. And we can see with that, that rice is the most profitable crop. Also, looking across region, we can see that the east and the north are the two regions with most yield. And we can see they are the top two most performing region. And also, looking at our line chart above, please go back, go to the next slide. Yes, yes. Looking at our irrigation and at that line chart above, we can see that there is a correlation between our soil moisture and our crop yield because you can see that as soon as irrigation dropped, soil moisture dropped as well, and that caused crop yield to reduce. So overall, we can see that to maintain higher yield, we need to ensure that our water levels are optimized. Next slide, please. Okay, so our, opt our water optimization analysis, so after analyzing our water sources and irrigation method, we discovered that our drip, our drip method is best suited for our well, our flood is best suited for our lake, and also our sprinkler is best suited for our river, as we see that the combination of these two methods provide the highest yield. And also across the region, no, previous slide, thank you. Across the region also, we can see that Yes, we can see that well, well produced most of the yield in the central, east, north, and west region, excluding the south region, which lake produced most of the yield. Next slide, please. Thank you. So diving deep into our profita regional profitability analysis, we're able to see that our top two most performing region are the east and the north region. As we can see that these two regions provide the highest yield, and therefore they are our most profitable region. And looking across the irrigation analysis also, this same yield, this same yeast and not also provided the highest irrigation. So we can see that there's a direct relationship between our, our yield and our irrigation. So in order for us to have higher, in order for us to have higher yield, we need to ensure that our irrigation is properly monitored. Next slide, please. Thank you. So diving into our risk analysis, we also discovered that our greatest threat to yield her pest and water so looking there we can see the two highlighted parts which one is uh um sugarcane we can see that sugarcane has low immune to pest attack and um rice has high immune to pest attack so now to ensure that we don't reduce our yield we need to ensure that our soil moisture we need to make sure that our soil moisture is properly monitored as well as our pest and we can also see with this chart that there is a similar trend within between between our um, precipitation, that's our rainfall, and our yes, our rainfall and also our soil moisture. So the higher the so, um, irrigation, the higher the soil moisture. So um, I'm going to hand over to. Uh, thank you very much, Joke. So looking after after taking care of you know, the risk, we decided to build a model around risk analysis. So we realized that um, soil moisture, battery life. Um, pH of the soil are things that indicate both severities and uh, the intensity and the types of you know, the pests that affect our, our yield in general. So we created a model that the company can use to predict how severe and what kind of pests can come in place. So next slide, please. So our recommendations is increase investment in rice, expand investment in the east and north region. South, south should improve their irrigation so that they can produce more yield improve the sensor battery life, and 
manage soil moisture properly. Amazing. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you very much. Thank I like you. That. Thank you, guys. Yeah. We have our next team, Data of IQ. Let's give it up for them. Please, let's give it up for the next team. As I, Okay, the representative is coming up. Five minutes. All right. Take us on. Hello, everyone. My name is Jetro Olowole. I rep Data Hub IQ. And I want to shout out to my um, teammates, Azan and Shidera. Unfortunately, they are not here. Um, so this is a farm data analysis for agri source, uh, agri sources incorporation. We receive the data set that include data from pet, crops, location, irrigation, you know, sensor, and all of that. So the first next slide. The next thing we do was to okay, I have to move that data into. Um, I love working with SQL for data transformation ETL. So I move it to um, Postgres SQL and do all my data analysis um, uh, transformation there, then generate three important tables. And if you look at the, the architecture, we have three tables we created for fact table, the one we call farm fact metrics. This table combines all the data that has timestamp using the date. So we have six tables in that table. We have the location crop metrics that join the location with crop data and other environmental data. So we have the location pest metrics. Because of the volume of the data set, we should have had the location farm metrics. But to be too large, we have about 2 million rows for it. So the volume will be too high. So we just break it to that too. So because of one more time, we stop with that free. Now, next slide. Um, I'm going to mirror this presentation around the deliverables for the data analyst for the data at that time. So I'm going to run through it because of time. Next slide, please. OK, in this uh, presentation, um, we are asked to find the profitability of the crops. You know, I could plot the crop yield against the crop type and get the figure. But we are asked to you know, consider the environmental factor. So one approach is to look at the present prices and then consider pest cost. But those data were not supplied. So I go for other options that use pro uh, profitability index. So what I did was to assign weight to each of those environmental factors that affect the crop. So, and I researched how much weight should be assigned based on how they affect the crop. Then multiply them by the crop yield, the figures, then add it to the crop yield. So when I plot the crop type against the crop yield, the result is a bit um, different from just plotting the crop type against the crop yield without considering those profitability uh, stocks. So you can see from the um, results, our profitability uh, results. Next slide. So the next slide, consider water resource allocation. Um, please go to the next slide. Um, you, you can read those tests are recommendations based on the results. So if you have the file, you can read it later. Now look at this um, picture. Think of it as a waterfall. When we plot the crop, we use the, the um, location farm metrics, uh, farm, farm fat metrics. When we plot the crop type against the water source and the irrigation method, you find out that the one that yields the highest result is the flood method, the sprinkler method rather, and the water uh, pond water source. So um, the, I think this side is, the, if you move the slide this way, the highest point there, the highest point on the left, you have the irrigation duration, at the bottom, you have the uh, water source and irrigation method. So the highest point there represents the point where we have the sprinkler method and the pond uh, water source, which is now the best combination for our farm. So this slide you are seeing, we are now taking the average um, value. OK, when you look at the total value, you might say that uh, that combination is the best. but 
is not in all cases. When you take the average value, you now see that flood method and pond water source is the best combination where there is little water resources. And that is what you get from this average. So we now come to the conclusion that if you are dealing with where there is enough water, you take pond, irrigate the farm with pond, then you use a sprinkler where there is enough water and flood where there is less water. Next slide, next slide. So this is regional crop yield. You can see the east region using the rest, the best results. And of course, followed by the rest. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. All right, without further ado, we'll go to the last but not the least, Akaton team. Yeah, so the last um, team is Data Dynasty. Please let's have it up for them. All right, Data Dynasty, let's have you. Um, hello, everyone. Okay, um, I'm starting my presentation with a story. Okay. In a quiet village from Sound City, there lived an elderly farmer named Jacob. Jacob's crops suffered from ash weather conditions, and that led to low harvest. But because he was a wise man, he decided to put in the work, and that led to a bountiful harvest. Then one day, Sarah, a younger farmer, she went to Jacob for advice, and Jacob told her, Sarah, Famine and life are the same. You sow your seed and you reap your harvest. And you need to know where to sow and when to reap. And Sarah and he also took her to his field and showed her the, his own field. And he told her, Sarah, different fields require different irrigation method. You must pay attention to the soil, the sun, and the water. And you must use technology to your own advantage. Sarah took Jacob's advice, and she got her own bountiful harvest. Just like Jacob's story. Just like Jacob's story. In farming and in life, the power of reaping and sowing depends on the choices we make. And that is why my team and I are here today to present to you the actionable insights we generated for AG resources to optimize their crop yield. Thank you. So please help me change the slide, please. <laughs> okay, so our ETF pipeline just shows how we took the data from Snowflake to Power BI and then for reporting. The next slide. Okay, <laughs> I need to move close. I use glasses. <laughs> okay, as you can see, our data set is from September 2022 to September 2023. And looking at it, we found out that they had a total yield of 14.33 million for the both years and a total average of 2.57 million. And can you please just show me get, um, year 2022 and year 2023, just briefly. Okay, so for year 2022, you can see that they got a total yield of 4.3 million, 4.33 million and a total harvest of 774,000. And in year 2023, please can you just show me your 2023? Thank you. <laughs> they had a total yield of 9.9 .9 million and a total harvest of 1.80. So please can you show me the both years together? Like, okay. No, the both here back, sorry, taking me fast. So together you can see that the best crop the best crops that gave the total yield were rice, carrot, and wheat. And you can now go to the water resource so we can just be fast. And then looking at the water resource, we can find out that this is the time they spent on irrigation. And you can see that for both years together, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three was quite low than quarter four. And that result can be found in the total yield per month. And apart from the fact that they took time on irrigation method, they also took time on their growth stage, which was um, <laughs> fruity, and, uh, and they had a great harvest. 
Uh, let's go to the region, please. The region. I'm trying to just go with the time. And looking at the region, you can find out that when it comes to temperature, the southern region is more preferable than in eastern region. But it's, the eastern region had higher humidity than the southern region. So let's go to the insights. Okay. The recommendation we have, though, is not clear, is that we told um, we want AG resources to focus more on rice and carrots since they had a better yield with that. And we also told them that they need to focus more on um, crops that have less humidity for the south and crops that can, you know, maybe retain more water in the east. And then we also told them that for profitability and for more yield, they should focus on the same product that they had earlier, which is yeah. carrot, rice, and wheat. Thank you. Had to rough. So thank you. Wow, thank you so much. That thank was, you, Tim. That was Dynasty. And before we wrap up this session, we'll have the sponsors of this year's hackathon. We'll have them present and just share a few things with us. So they are connecting virtually, uh, and we should have them on screen. Um, so while we wait, um, immediately after the sponsors have made their talk, we have a breakout session, right? Now uh, the breakout sessions are for you know interest groups. Think of it that way, right? So we have uh, four of them, right? So while we wait, let me just mention them so that we can start gearing up, right? So we have a breakout room called Sankofa. So please watch what this Sankofa room is over there. You would see a group of chairs facing the, tea, uh, the television there. Still maintain your seats. We'll tell you how you'll go in a moment. So Sankofa, uh, over there, you'll be having a talk on unleashing insights from blockchain network, a dive into blockchain data analytics. So if you are interested in blockchain technology, Sankofa is the right place to be. That, uh, Hello, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but I can't hear anything.
All right, just. Everyone, um, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending. Uh, I wish I'd been able to get here today just to see like the excitement and uh, everyone coming and participating. Thanks to Data Community Africa for, for partnering with, uh, with us to, to run their Datathon. Um, so my name is Sofian and I'm co-founder and CTO of Dicey Tech. And essentially at Dicey Tech, uh, we're building a social professional network and a scale intelligence platform. Uh, the idea is that, do you remember up getting your first proper job? Odds are, it was a bit stressful and confusing. Now, imagine that you're about to finish formal education today and take a leap of faith into the job market. Uh, you can hear how quickly jobs are evolving. Jobs that are here yesterday are being automated tomorrow. Um, you can work remotely. You can work, you can work anywhere across the globe, you know, but how do you present yourself, you know? Uh, the transition from education and employment is really a dicey time in most people's lives. And we're here to fix that. So from working in this space uh, for the past five years, we found that early career for early career, it's more of a work experience gap. So students acquire skills and knowledge, but they don't necessarily have the opportunity to contextualize and apply them in a real context. This means that you're going to spray and pray. We've all been there. You just apply to as many jobs and as many companies as you can. And the, it means that the biggest company receive thousands of identical applications and small companies are largely ignored. Most of the time, your first job, you might even quit it in the first six months because it's not what you expected it to be. So we use AI to surface skills from proof of work via project portfolios. So there are two aspects to our solutions. One is a social platform where you can connect with, uh, you can connect your workspace and work output, uh, showcase your skills and your project portfolio. And the other is an AI skill engine that analyzes your, your unique data set and identify and quantify your skills and create a common language between you and employers and other prof data professionals to talk about your skills. So as a data professional, uh, you create a portfolio, you know, you create, you connect your social profiles, you connect your GitHub account, your Power BI dashboard, any project that you've, that you've done. And the skill profile for each of your projects is extracted, AI generated, and then aggregated into your own unique portfolio. And you can then use that to find opportunity mm -hmm when it comes to education. So based on your weaknesses, your strength, what, what you want to learn next, and also job opportunities. Where do you want to go next? What job is the ideal fit for you? If you have an ideal job in mind, you know, how far off are you from this? And from an employer perspective, uh, employers can create a hub where you can showcase your brand, communicate the way, the, the what and why you do what, what you do. And then you can create project challenges and hackathon to attract people into role-specific talent pools and identify top performers to engage. Finally, as an employer, you can also post a job, add project assessments that reflect the, the real nature of the work and find the right people for the right job. Um, it was great to see the activity going on during the Datathon. Uh, loved the energy and loved the creativity that I've seen showcased in those projects. With Data Community Africa, we're looking to partner and foster a community where scales are valued and help talents get discovered. And I assume that if you're here today, you're ready to be part of the movement. So join us in revolutionizing the way data professionals navigate their career. Together, we can bridge the work experience gap and empower individuals to showcase their skills through project mm -hmm. portfolios. Say goodbye to the spray and spray job application and welcome meaningful opportunities across the globe. We have uh, more coming up. We have other competitions coming up, more partnership with Data Community Africa. And we also have job opportunities coming up on the platform from companies both in Nigeria and abroad. So stay tuned. The website is dicetech.co.uk. And if you have any questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to hear any feedback and uh, help answer any question that you have. Thank you, everyone.
dream work. All right? So let's do it. Let the world know that there's a gathering of data professionals, data enthusiasts, right here in the heart of Lagos, in the heart of Nigeria. And we are all here talking data, sharing data, connecting, and building together. All right? So I'm refreshing. I'm refreshing. If I, do, you, do you have it already? Can you see? Can we, are we topping the chat? No, we are not. <laughs> not yet. Not Guys, yet. let's do this. Do this. Tweet, 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 tweet. All right? Don't forget to use the hashtags as well. The hashtags are very important. Okay, looks like we're almost there. And remember, guys, it's also important to have a good social media footprint. As a data professional, you know, some of us have shared our story earlier on. One of the things that has helped a couple of us is the fact that we also have good social media footprints. If you are in a data conference, let the world know. Share it. It's nothing to keep. Oh, I'm here in the largest community of, among the largest community of um, data professionals, and I'm learning from experts, right? I'm connecting with people. Let the world know. <laughs> let the world know. So if you are not tweeting, if you are not sharing on, on LinkedIn, I mean, I don't know how to convince you otherwise, but it's important to let the world know that you are here. So we have 30 more minutes before I bring on our next speaker. So please let us tweet about our attendance here. All right. Tweet about your attendance. Put it on LinkedIn. You know, put it everywhere. Put it everywhere. All right. Two more minutes. If you are still contemplating, do I want to do? You can tweet more than once. I'm sure you know. Data Fest Africa 2023, DFA 23. That, those are the hashtags. It's not going to cost you anything. <laughs> it won't cost you anything. Instead, we want to amplify the fact that we're doing this together and that the fact that you are here, right, and doing this with us. Okay. So if I, I think we're doing well, I'm sure we are somewhere, uh, somewhere in the, in the top, uh, let me see. I'm sure we are somewhere in the top, maybe top 15 hashtags, right? Um, and kudos to every one of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you know that you're also building your social media profile, our footprint that way. So it's good that you've shared. All right. So without further ado, we're going to move to the next um, session group, all right? And what we'll be doing is, is something I, I think is very important. They are lightning talks. Lightning talks. Remember, at the beginning of this session, we had a lot of startup ideas, lovely data use cases, and I'm sure a lot, a lot of us already connected the dots, you know, listening to those startup ideas, all right? So in the next 30 minutes, so we have 10, 10 minutes for each of our speakers, We'll be having lightning talk. The first lightning talk is going to be given by D Brown Consulting Group. Right? Remember, we had the CEO earlier on. So I believe he's going to be coming with his team to share with us for 10 minutes. Then after that, we're going to have Oguniro Oluwashi Jibomi, who is going to be coming also for 10 minutes. Then after that, we'll have Wale Adeyemo, who is also coming for 10 minutes. Right? And then, after that, we'll have a sponsorship session. We'll have a panel session. We'll then have another sponsorship session. We'll have a talk, lightning talk on data governance, journey and aspiration of data community Africa, where David is going to be facilitating that. And then we have the hackathon announcement. And then we have something interesting. And I think that every one of you should wait till then because you will love it. It's something interesting just before we wrap up for the day. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome, uh, with a round of applause, the Deep Brown Consulting Group team members to come give us a lightning talk. 
please make them welcome. A lightning, a lightning round of talk. applause for D Brown. Round of applause. I know you are tweeting, but uh, uh, come on, guys. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Let's do this. All right. More people. I didn't see anybody doing press ups, as I said, but it's okay. They came late, but they're sitting down. All right. So, um, organizations collect data from multiple to touch points videos. to enable them know. to make effective, profitable, data driven decisions. Yet, a lot of data just sits there. Why? Well, organizations operate two systems operational or transaction systems and analytic systems. Operational systems are data repository, where you execute business processes. Analytic systems are where you make sense of your data and evaluate business processes. Analysts spend 80% of their time cleaning and preparing data to update routine reports, and only 20% of their time truly brainstorming on the numbers and extracting insight from that data. The result? Less time to ask the right questions about their data, and less time to pull variable insights that can improve your bottom line. At D. Brown Consulting, we have a better approach. We empower you to extract insights from your data at the speed of thought. We employ a curated methodology that simplifies the analytic build process to eliminate technical friction, making it easier for everyone in your organization to get the exact data they need securely. The best part? All of this can be done without relying on overburdened IT teams. D. Brown Consulting offers consultancy services in building, reporting, and analytics systems. As Microsoft Gold Partners, we offer business process automation solutions with no-code and low-code applications, chatbots, and robotic process automation engines, and financial modeling services. We visualize our reports, dashboards, and analytics using the principles defined by the International Business Communication Standards, IBCS. The use of standardized notation eliminates ambiguity and ensures consistency in the design of your visualization and storytelling. Are you looking to achieve more with your data? Contact us today. Visit dbrownconsulting.net. All right, so hello, hello, everybody. So I, I asked the question earlier that who was looking for work? Quite a lot of people put their hands up, even though they had work. And I know, um, well, I, I hear that your employers are not here, but guess what? They're watching online. So make sure you cover your face. So who is looking for work? Okay. Okay. So we have this passion in DRAM, right? We love to train. So we do a lot of training on data analytics, all the power platform, the RPA, and all that kind of stuff, and then financial modeling. So I have a background in accounting, financial modeling, and talent, and quite other hats as well. So we do a lot of financial modeling. Financial modeling is not the modeling bits, you know what modeling is, but financial modeling is taking financials of a company and then predicting what's going to happen in the future. Seeing trends in the business, going into a new business, a new line of business, let's see how profitable you're going to be in the future. So you need a bit of accounting skills. Who is an accountant here? Very few. Okay. Who knows accounting? Who collects salary every month? Some people work for free. Wonderful. I thought, <laughs> so if you're collecting salary, you know a bit of finance. You know something a little bit in finance, right? So it's not, it's not that difficult. So what we intend to do, one of our aims, one of our goals, right, is to train one million analysts, financial analysts, in the next five years. One million. How are we going to do that? We can't do that alone. So what we're doing is we're signing up all our universities. We're signing up all the professional bodies that have something to do with finance. ICANN is signed up, ACCA, CFA, all of them. We're signing up tuition houses and stuff like that. But more importantly, we also want to get them employed. It's not just to train them. So we're also signing up the upworks and stuff of this world that are local to Nigeria and Africa. But again, we see that people cannot afford, I mean, how much does it cost to train a financial modeler to world-class standard? About $3,000. $3,000 is the general cost 
to train someone that's a good accounting, knows accounting, knows business, knows economics and stuff to become a world-class financial modeler, about $3,000. We can't afford that. So we partnered with the Financial Modeling Institute in Canada. I know you like Canada. Anytime you hear Canada, you're thinking of JAPA, isn't it? You know JAPA. So those that don't understand what JAPA is, it's going to be in the English dictionary very soon, I'm sure. Yes, because we use it a lot. So this JAPA syndrome, I think we think that we can stay in Nigeria, eat our pounded yam and stuff while working for Canada. We don't need to leave, right? We just need a few things done, security, Hopefully, things will get done. But we really, I don't think we want to go minus 20 degrees centigrade. Who wants that? Please, I actually want to know. Who loves minus 20 degrees? One person, two, three, four. Is it you love minus 20 degrees or you just want to go? <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I, I think that we can be the hub of the world, the BPO capital of the world. You know what BPO means? Business process outsourcing capital of the world. That's what India has been, but we can do that here. And quite a lot of us here, there's some digital nomads here that work everywhere. I know someone is going to Cape Verde already after this. Very nice, cool job. I can't do that anymore. I think I'm too old. That's too bad. Anyway, so here we did, what they did with the Financial Modeling Institute is they've sponsored that $3,000. We've crashed it to $347. The exam alone is about $700, the Canadian exam. So we've crashed that $3,000 to $347. I think, yeah, you should clap for that because that is huge. Now, your first model you build after this, you probably will charge $1,000 for it. You can't charge less than that. So what we want to do is we're going to train whoever is in this academy solidly for eight weeks. Is a cohort-based thing, so you're going to be put into an accountability hub of your peers and try and make you accountable. But after eight weeks, you'll be able to build any model from scratch. You'll be able to take a company and build a detailed model. We'll then hand you over to the Financial Modeling Institute, who will groom you a little bit and then examine you. Now, I was talking to the CFA president worldwide. Who, any CFA charter holders here? It's a very top thing, CFA chart holder. So I told him that the problem I have with generally accountants, finance people, is they can't execute what wonderful plans they have because they can't build models. Building models is like building a software. They can't build models. And he said something very clear. He said, look, how do you test a practical skill with theory and multiple choice? You know, most of our exams are theory and multiple choice. So that's what the Financial Modeling Institute solved. Your exam, a camera will be looking at you, they'll be looking at your screen, they'll give you the financials of a company, historical financials. You're supposed to build a model from scratch in a blank Excel spreadsheet. Detailed five-year strategic plan, detailed model from scratch in four hours. That's your exam. So when you do that exam and get a certification, it means I can build models. So imagine that if you're doing, let's say, Power BI exam, you must build the whole thing, then someone will examine it. That's what the Financial Modeling Institute does. So they've partnered with us and we have Project Africa. That's why we're able to offer that. They're sponsoring it. But we, I now said, look, sorry, in Nigeria, even the 347 is nice, but we still can't afford it. So we did something special for only students, $150. You get the $1,200 course, $800 or $700 exam, about $500 in other perks and stuff. The whole $3,000 crashed to $150 only for students. You can't lie that I'm a student. Someone came and said, I'm doing PhD. I said, wonderful, you don't qualify. You, you need to be an undergrad student or a student of a professional body we recognize. I can student, CFA student, ACT and stuff like that, those students. Because, I mean, $150, you have to leave others to come in. We also have a boot camp. How many people have qualified for our boot camp? It's already closed. Who qualified here? Our boot camp, 1,000 people is who are training. I can see some hands up. Excellent. So we're training 1,000 people. That's for free on data analytics, power apps, power virtual agents and stuff, and also on financial modeling. So the 1,000 becomes 800, becomes 600, becomes what? 400, then 200, the finalists come to our office. Those finalists probably already have jobs because their clients waiting to employ them. 
right? But then again, it gradually goes up to employ the remaining thousand. So those that said they have, they need work. Unfortunately, I know in the bootcamp, but you can still follow us. We think that Nigeria will be the BPO capital of the world. I really, really think that. And we enjoy, we employ all of you to join us in trying to drive to that process. I want to say a big thank you to my team. We have uh, wonderful people in Debra and there's some at the back. We have a booth there where you can pick our flyers and stuff, Debra and Consulting. And we look forward to all of you, not jackpotting, but collecting that jackpot money while you're here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Deep Brown Consulting Team. Thank you very much. So guys, opportunities on a platter of gold. I'm sure we would all make the most of it. All right? The next lightning talk. Um, the next lightning talk will be taken by Oguniro Oluwa Shijibomi, and we'll be talking on exploring machine learning strategies in quantitative investing. Please, let's give a round of applause for Oguniro Oluwa Shijibomi. Energy, energy, keep it up. Energy, energy. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm really happy to be here to talk about, um, can you hear me? Okay. Hello everyone. Okay. Um, so I'm really glad to be here to talk about, um, applying financial machine learning to invest in, next slide please. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm a quant. Uh, I work around quant data science. I've been in that for um, about three years, uh, working on high frequency trading systems. And um, I've also been in the data world for about five years plus, um, doing building stuff around um, investment purpose and also applying artificial intelligence uh, for that use case. Next slide. Okay, so um, there's this interesting movie. I don't know how many of us have watched uh, The Big Shot um, that talked about the 2008 housing crisis um, in the United States and that spread around the world. Um, so there's a big question here. What will you do if you know the future of the market? Can AI help you to make such predictions? Next slide, please. Um, this is not clear really, but I'm just talking about quantitative, what is quantitative investing? Um, so when we, we are data people, and so when we involve um, data analysis or data science or machine learning to make appropriate investment decisions, um, then what you are doing is you are doing a quantitative investing work. And also another interesting thing to define is what is alpha. So um, if you are used to bonds or forex, uh, you are trading like different asset systems, um, you want to uh, be able to convince your investors that you can beat just trading any broker, right? So the alpha is what every edge fund manager wants to get. He wants to be able to have a higher alpha than the market and to be able to use that to um, convince the investors. So as a machine learning engineer, as a data scientist, um, your plan is to generate higher alpha so you can use that to convince your investors. Next slide. So what is machine learning? Um, next slide. Um, so machine learning or the Hermel algorithm, um, as we know, it learns complex patterns uh, within high dimensional space. So the factoring between that, uh, the logical human mind uh, will not be able to factor in such um, conditions because we are limited, but machine learning can do that in milliseconds and it can properly represent and do appropriate predictions. Next slide. So what's the breakthrough in machine learning? Machine learning, just like the first heat map here, that is just learning the correlation of, imagine you have like different assets. You can learn the 
give a statistical measure of the correlation. But when you apply machine learning like a clustering system to it, then it kind of looks at a lot of futures and can properly cluster those into uh, very important information. And so machine learning gives much more powerful information to your system. Next slide. Also, can machine learning predict unexpected events? Um, there's, there's a theory called a black swan theory. Uh, a black swan is something that you are not expecting. So for example, uh, the 2008 housing crisis was a very powerful one of a black swan. Uh, even though pandemics can, uh, things that occur, but the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that happened also was affected the market like, with a very big uh, impact. And machine learning can be able to learn those theories, right? So because pandemics, uh, they have, uh, don't forget the data you're training on um, is as dimensional space in terms of the futures and in terms of the time, the time space, right? So those dimensional space can give theories for the model to be able to properly diagnose different situations. And so yes, it can learn from the theories. Next slide. Also, machine learning can learn um, hierarchical systems. So your, your favorite Titanic regression models or classification models, um, there is a kind of an hierarchical nature in how it is being built. So for example, um, a female in the first class or the second class cabin might survive, but the female in the third class cabin might not survive the Titanic um, crash. So there is an hierarchical nature in the way it is learning the distributions of the data, and that's one of the power of machine learning. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Yeah, just go to the next one. So let's just go because of our time to the current applications of machine learning. The first one is a price prediction. Price prediction as interesting, you might see that in your YouTube videos or uh, in different um, books. But I can tell you it's one of the most complex parts where you can apply machine learning to. A lot of them you see online are like, they are literally fake, right? Because the price systems are not stationary as you see them. It has a lot of uh, noise and um, there are no proper signals there. So when you use machine learning, you have to factor in a lot of regulation metrics and also you have to change the dimensions of the data. Most of the applications you see here is forecasting volatility or you forecast the, the returns, which is more stationary than the price. And yes, so because of that nature, machine learning can actually give you, and there are edge funds all over the world that do that. They're able to speculate the price, um, given those futures they have. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, also in portfolio, okay, I have one before, but let's go to this one. Also, also in portfolio construction and analysis. Um, so when you want to have um, stocks that you group together. Some of, some of us, we trade different stocks at different points in time, right? Uh, you want to be able to know which of your portfolios perform best, or you want to be able to rank them into different uh, metrics. You want to know which one uh, is going to give you much, much returns, right? Maybe your year to date or your month to date. Machine learning can properly rank those portfolios and can be able to give you more weight on the strategies or the portfolios that you should invest in and the ones should reduce your um, returns on. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, so outlier detections, um, an interesting phenomena. We see that a lot in machine learning. Um, most of us are involved with it. But in the market, it's very, very, it's a very, very big factor, a huge factor. Uh, we have serious bubbles in market. Markets can rise up in milliseconds and fall down in milliseconds. Um, of a recent, we had a tech bubble and we have a series of bubble coming. So with the current applications of financial machine learning, we have models like ransack models that are not affected by outliers. Even up to 40% nature of outliers, they can see stand and be able to give proper predictions, right? So, Many hedge funds, um, global hedge funds or macro hedge funds, they use machine learning, they use outlier detection models to be able to do that prediction. Next slide. Uh, 
Okay, bed sizing. This is one of the most interesting part. I personally have worked a lot around bed sizing. Uh, most edge funds, when they see you, you can do a good job in building risk model. From my, um, from my personal uh, project, um, you want to be able to know if what you are building or if the, uh, so you have a short position or a long position on any asset. And you want to know the buying power. You want to know how much um, allocation you should invest. Um, there are a lot of things that involve a lot of grammar. We have meta labeling. We have triple buyer methods and different things involved. But yes, you can be able to know the buying power of or to know how much money you should invest into a particular strategy at any point in time using machine learning. And this is one of the most applied use cases in global edge funds. Next slide. Future importance. Um, I'm aware if you're a machine learning practitioner, you want to be able to model and know the futures that are the most powerful, uh, that give proper insights to the model you're building. Um, so future importance can help you to be able to do that. Next slide. Okay. So credit rating analysis and risk systems. Also, uh, you can be able to rate your credit systems, rate different assets with machine learning, and provide proper recommendations. Next slide. On structured data, sentiment analysis. Some of us, we can plug into Twitter API, load uh, maybe Tesla stock, use the sentiments to know the directions you want to go. And that's also an interesting aspect in machine learning. Next slide. And detect detection of uh, false investment strategies. I think this also is very, just the same way that you have um, some investment strategies that um, are going to go on the wrong side, even though maybe through your back test. So back test, for those that might not know, is um, a situation where you gauge um, and you're able to estimate how good a strategy is over a period in time using different metrics. And so when you have, you can have scenarios where back test is giving the wrong signal, uh, machine learning can help you to be able to detect such strategies and work there. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, for those that um, want to go really deep into this, um, I'll recommend you, um, there's this interesting book, um, Advances in Financial Machine Learning um, by Marcos Des Leprado. Um, there are also some interesting books that are communities, um, global communities like the Adia Lab community, uh, they have a Discord channel. You can go on it, search on it on Google and join them. Um, you'll be able to participate in competitions and they give rewards. And I can tell you that the quant world is a very big world. Uh, it's a very big industry. Um, on a very good scale, they rank um, in terms of pay range and all, they rank even much more higher than the data science or data scientists. So um, it's a very good thing to explore. And um, I wish you all the best. Um, in your journey in the quant world. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful lightning session. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we'll proceed to the next session. Uh, it's a 15-minute talk from one of our sponsors, Cartwig and Dale. Uh, if we have representative of Cartwig and Dale, please uh, make your way to the front. All right. So it's a sponsorship session. Uh, I'm sure they have some good stuff to tell us. Uh, and I'm sure we would all enjoy that session. So representative, please um, come to the front. All right. So guys, less than two hours to the end of the session. Like I said, towards the end of this session, we have some interesting things we want to communicate. Uh, we'll still be having uh, David Abu come on stage uh, to share with us. So please, you want to stay till the end, right? We are here. I mean, let's make the most of it, right? So we have representative of Cartwig and Dale now, and they will be taking us on a 15-minute journey. All right, thank you. Please, with a round of applause, let's welcome them. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, that hand clap is, is, is not loud enough for a sponsor. I mean, like we sponsored Data First, we shouldn't come here and the clap with the food that we ate this afternoon, we shouldn't come here and the clap is very. This, please, a round of applause for your sponsor, Catwick and Dale. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate the compassion. Okay, so yeah, we are Patrick and Dale. We are a tech law firm. And I'm sure you'll be wondering what is what are lawyers doing amidst data enthusiasts, data professionals, and all of that. We will explain and we'll help you understand. Okay. So um I'm here with Lois. Lois is my partner at Patrick and Dale. Say hello to Lois. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start with a question. I want to understand or I want to know if any of you here um, knows the law that regulates data usage in Nigeria. I have, a, I have a gift for you. Does anybody know the law that regulates data in Nigeria? There's a hand over there, please. What? The NDPR. Uh, are you sure? Are you correct? Are you sure? Is that your final answer? Yes. Any other person? Okay, there's the lady here. Please say it louder. Uh, she got it correct. Please, a round of applause for her. Nanja. But not, not she. You are Googling. There's a lady here that answered. I said what? No, no she no. didn't say body. She said Data Protection Act. So yeah. it's Nigerian Data Protection Act 2023. Please go to our booth after this session. Tell them the mass thanks you. Thank you. Not you. Not you. Is that lady I'm talking to? <laughs> not you. Not everybody, please. Is that lady? So we so don't leave here bankrupt. Sorry, Dima. <laughs> for the lady who said NDPR, you were close enough, but with the 2023 Act, the NDPR is no more enforceable. But for attempting, for attempting, for attempting, go to our booth and tell them Dima sent you. Just Thank you, you, just Dima. you, please. So we don't leave here bankrupt. Imagine everybody going to our booth and saying Dima sent me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this act is applicable to every person that um, makes use of data in Nigeria, but with emphasis on data controllers and data processors. So if you're a data controller, you're a data processor, you have a platform or you have a service that people can subscribe to, imputing their names, their details, their health status, their religion, and all of that then this act actually regulates how you make use of this data you get. Uh, can we get the slides up so people can, because we're seeing a lot of legal jargon. All right. So the Nigeria Data Protection Act, that is everything that you guys do, that is the act. Well, maybe not everything, but most things. Yeah. That is the act that protects or protects people like us when you collect our data, how you use it, what you use it for. It is all governed by the government. <laughs> um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, uh, you, can, you can go to the next slide. Dima has talked about this. So this is for data collectors and processors. Now, how do you just use personal data. It says that you have to use it lawfully. You have to use it for the purpose that you collect it for. It must be used for that specific purpose. You can't store people's data forever. There's a limitation. So how long you store this data, the law is watching. Their eyes are on you. So there's a time period that you need to deletes people's data from your system. Transparency and fairness. How you use it, it has to be transparent and you have to use it fairly, so to speak. And then confidentiality. So that means that if you come to Dima, myself, you know, have a product, we fill in our information, you cannot just share that information with anybody. Not only share, you cannot sell. 
that is why the data that is collected in data first here you know when you came in you signed up right the data that was collected data first community is not going to use it for any other purpose other than for the community purpose so that is being confidential any company that needs people's data cannot just walk up to the community and say hey please sell this data to me or share your this data to, with me and all of that it is not permissible thank you dima okay we move on to another point sensitive personal data and child rights so we might have situations where we need to collect first of all what is who what do you think sensitive personal data would include somebody anybody throw me and okay the crew there in the hat the guy in the black hat okay he said mental the, health correct. correct there's a gift for you please clap for him go to anybody, the booth anybody on this section yeah what Bank details. All right. right, there's a gift for you. That lady over there. Sorry, can you echo? I can't hear. Home address. Mm, yes, yes, it's sensitive. It says things like religion, your health status, sexual orientation, sexual orientation. All those things are sensitive. So, as a data analyst or a data enthusiast, you should be very careful in, in the way you handle this, um, this information. Then the next one is um, child's rights, right? Children below 18 years. That is why when you have a platform that requires people coming up to sign up or subscribe, you need to ask them for their age. Anybody that is below 18 years should get parental consent or um, consent from their legal guardian. Please, on no account, on no account should you have details of children on your platform or on your services without consent. There are people that have paid heavily for this. There are ways you can get, you may ask, okay, how do I get this parental consent? It's very easy and very simple. At that point where you require this information, ask them, are you 18 years or below? Or are you 18 years or, ab or above? If they say, are you 18 years and above? If they say no, then you ask another question. Have you received consent from your parents or legal guardian to subscribe to this service or to subscribe to this platform? If they think yes, then the law takes it that you have required this consent and they have informed you that they got this consent. Are we together? But that particular question has to be there, please. There are people, I repeat, there are people that have paid heavily because they ignored the fact that as a child, there are decisions that you cannot make on your own. A child cannot just wake up and give out their house address and give you their sex orientation and the likes of that. Those are the those are things that are classified under sensitive information. Thank you, Dima. She's the real lawyer. <laughs> okay. Um, final thing I'll talk about before we talk about what will happen if you don't listen to everything that we've said and do it. Um, cross-border data transfers. So what this means is essentially, the law is saying that if you collect my data here in Nigeria, you can't send it anywhere else. It has mm -hmm. to be used in this jurisdiction. Now, if you have a company um, that um, deals with data from different jurisdictions, you need to ab abide by, say, let's say, Nigeria, US, UK, Singapore. You need to abide by the different data protection laws of each of these countries. So the Nigeria Data Protection Act, that's for Nigeria. In the UK and the EU, there's the GDPR. Um, in the US, there's their uh, own data protection laws. So essentially, what it is is when you're dealing with large amounts of data, you need to make sure that as you collect the data, you are handling that data the way the law allows you to, or else. Yes. Hmm. Or else, it's serious, bege, bege. If you misuse people's data, if you sell people's data, if you treat people's data in such a way that it infringes on their data privacy rights, Kiri Kiri is calling your name, and you don't want to answer. It's not our portion in Jesus' name. I'm not here, amen. 
Ah, okay, oh, don't please don't try with misusing people's data in any way. And if you do, do you know the penalty? Should I tell you the penalty? Hmm. Two percent, at least two. That's if the government wants to smile at you. Two percent of your gross revenue. So imagine, as a company, you've made two million dollars at the end of the year, and you just infringed. You may call it a little infringement, <laughs> but when the government change change them for you, <laughs> you will you will see it in three D, four D. Okay, all right. Um, but so where again, does Katwig and Dale come in? Yes. Yeah, so again, that is why Katwig and Dale is here for you. You see how we have made the provisions of this NDP a very appear very simple and easy for you to understand. That is what Katwig and Dale do. Why a tech law firm? Why a women-led African tech law firm? So we provide legal services to startups, to individual data enthusiasts, data professionals like you all. And, and that is why we are here. We sponsored this program last year, and we are happy to sponsor it again this year. By God's grace, Data Fest 2024 will be bigger and even better. Here with me is um, my partner, Lois. We have another partner, Karen. The three of us studied information technology and intellectual property law. So this is what we breathe for a living. Are we together? So now, if you've been wondering what, what, what are lawyers doing in a data community, what is concerned about with overload? This is now what's in concern us with this, okay? So at Katri Gandel, um, over time dealing with startups, dealing with founders, business owners, data processors, and data controllers, we've identified a major problem. What is that problem? People are engrossed. People are, are, are more focused into building their startup, into uh, being engrossed in what they are doing, and, all of that, and they forget about legal. When you talk about, you know, legal, we are really... We are underrated in this country, Sha, but anyhow, anyhow, we'll survive, okay? It's only when people get into trouble that they remember that, oh, I need a lawyer. But we're here for you so that we can help you um, start out right without necessarily getting into trouble. So we have put together templates of agreement, basic agreements that you would need as a business owner, as a founder, as a data enthusiast, and as a data professional when starting out. Things like shareholders agreement, founders agreement, employment contract, and so many other documents, terms of use, privacy policy. There is no reason why people should come on your platform, on your, on your um, website, subscribe, or put in their details without them seeing a privacy policy. That privacy policy pretty much says what you are doing with their data and telling them, see, calm down, your data is safe with us. And that alone gives them the, the, the motivation to know that Oh, these people, they know what they are doing, and they're going to use our, misuse our data for any reason, even terms of use, so that tomorrow nobody comes on your website and say, oh, you promised me this, you promised me that, you did not deliver, I'm, still, I'm suing you to court. So we put together this document and all that. You know, if you go to a lawyer and ask a lawyer to draft a document for you, minimum they will charge you. It's like, they will charge you, Sha, they will charge you, not very pocket friendly. You, you get that. Okay, but we have put together this document and we have said, okay, this, for example, we have our, um, the premium package. The premium package has 22 documents. Imagine asking a lawyer to draft 22 documents for you. You know how much the lawyer is going to charge you for that. We put this, I mean, <laughs> she's asking me how much does Katu Gandel charge? Uh -uh, we, are, we are budget friendly now. Uh, we don't charge that much. But if I prepare 22 documents, for a single client, or more, if I don't buy Ferrari before the end of this year, eh, what will you call me? It's not bastard, Sha. Charge and bill. Charge and bill. <laughs> okay, so we put these documents together and we're giving them out at a giveaway price, at a steal. If you buy these 22 documents from us, this bundle of 22 documents, at this event, and for this event only, you are going to get it at a 50% discounted rate, and that is how much? 129,000 Naira. No lawyer will collect 129,000 Naira to draft 22 documents for you. And even included uh, questions that investors like to ask. Questions for you to ask investors. Those are for startups and business owners. I can't, this, the hand clap is too small now. Are we, uh, are we, Please keep help, you, ma. help, just help my life now. How can I work so hard? And you are clapping for me, this, this small, this small clap. Okay. And then, yes, for some of you that may not, that cannot afford that amount, we have a pocket friendly, a package as well, which we call the light package. That light package has nine fundamental documents 
right? Nine fundamental documents, including the additional information, what investors like to ask, and questions to, like inve to ask investors. We put this together, and we're giving it out to you for this data first community alone, for today's event, at the rate of 62,500 Naira. Get it today, or forever hereafter. Hold your peace. Thank you very much. I hope you all enjoy. Oh, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. Please, because we're if nice you are, like that. just because we are nice like that, I almost forgot. If you are a founder here, or you are a business owner, or you are, you are an em employer of labor, right? If you are an, an employee, if you need legal advice, for this once, Last time, we did it last year, we got like 57 people signed up for our free legal advisory. Trust me, for like three weeks, I kept on talking. Blah, 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 blah. I was jumping from one call <laughs> to the other. This time around, we discussed it, and I said, I'm not sure I'm, I'm about to venture into that. But this once, again, I'm going to give it to you. If you know that you have a legal need, and you need legal advice, you cannot afford it. Take this golden opportunity. Come to our booth. Scan the QR code, impute your details. Next week, I'll reach out to you and we'll schedule a 30 minute free legal advisory. I will be there, my partner will be there, Kaya will be there, and you can pick our brain for free. Data First Africa. God bless you, you, everyone. Man. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And clap for me again, no? Oh. Clap for me. No, me, I like clap. Guys, you can do that better. I mean, this is opportunity on a platter of gold. And thank you so much, Kadwig and Dale, for that wonderful session. Guys, the prize of lawyers is not being so. So for Kadwig and Dale to give us this offer, I mean, you want to make the most of it. So their boot is at the back. Make sure you get them, reach out to them. All right? I have good news for you. We're still going to have a panel session, remember? And I tell you, after the panel session, we have some gifts that we want to give out, all right? For example, we have, this is a hoodie, customized hoodie of Data First Africa 2023. We're we'll giving them out. We have more than one, all right? So you want to stay till the end. And again, like I said, we have some important information that we want to communicate. So please, let's make sure to stay till the end, all right? I see that a lot of founders are already moving towards the back. It's okay, but let's all make sure that we is you know, still maintain the order, all right? So we have another lightning speech, all right? A lightning talk by Wale Adeyemo, who is going to tell us on when data is not enough, tell a story. Honestly, I'm looking forward to this conversation, and Wale is here. He's going to lead us in exactly 10 minutes of talk, and then after that, we would go on to the panel session. Guys, the panel session, these panel seats are going to be hot, all right? So we're going to be having that panel session. So Wale, please... Um, come off stage and let's have you. Let's give Wale a round of applause as he comes off, off stage. Thank you. The energy is still high. I like that. A round of applause, please. Wow, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> one, one, one announcement, please. So we still have some food, right? Eden. So you can go outside. If you want to pick up snacks, go outside and pick up snacks. Of course, with just a token. All right, so, <laughs> so, but go outside and pick up snacks, you know, very important. All right, thank you. Okay. Can we have a slide? Okay. Hi, good evening, everyone. So it's data first day two, but this is my day one. So but for everybody that's posted something on Twitter, you've really done a lot. So we've been catching up on Twitter. My session is about when data is not enough, tell a story. So everybody here, I think I'll be right to assume we are all data people, and we so much believe in the power of data. Uh, so much that you think data can do everything, data always has all the answer, and data can even help, you know, and have a list. I saw that on Twitter today. So, but I want to add a layer to this conversation, which is sometime, Data is not just enough. Sometimes data have some limitations. Uh, the theme of this year's edition is focused on businesses, helping businesses unlock you know, insights from data. And I think you should pay attention to this. If you're currently working with any organization that has something to do with money, 
that has to make decisions, that have to sell a product or a service, or just any kind of organization that you know is involved in exchanging value for money. So next slide, please. Next slide. So we are just hearing data-driven this, data-driven that, data-driven marketing, data-driven product development, data-driven HR, data-driven decision making. But my question is, is data always or is data truly enough all the time? Next slide. I agree that data is very, very valuable. I'm not disputing that, right? I'm not yet to put a case. I don't have an hypothesis that is trying to push it to your throat that data is not valuable. Data is highly invaluable, but sometimes or most times from my experience, data most times have some three limitations. One, data can be very boring. Data can be biased. This is very, very, very critical. If you're using a biased data, any analytics you're doing on it, any insights you're deriving from a biased data, the insight is most likely going to be flawed. So data can be biased. And a lot of time, data can be blank with zero emotions. Now, decisions maker, especially in corporate setting, big organizations, they use data to make decisions. But trust me, most times, people need something that can connect with their emotion. They need something that can touch them. You need to sell a story to them beyond showing them the numbers, right? Sometimes the numbers will not just, you know, really eat them at the right spot. Next slide. Uh, why do we need to tell a story? I told you data can be boring. Story had flesh and life to data. Think about story like that spice you need to add to your food. So you're cooking rice, whatever you're doing, until you have salt and maggi and something else to that food. No matter what you're cooking, without the spice, you won't really get so much from what you're doing. Data also provide context. Context is very, 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 very powerful. On Twitter, people throw numbers around the lot. So you see posts like 80% of kiniko kiniko is something. 50% of, you know, stuff like that. Zero context. So a lot of time, even the message they're trying to pass is lost in the crowd. Now, data also, story also does something that is very powerful. Stories create emotional connection. If you want to drive change, real actual change, either within an organization, within the government, policy change, you need more than data, right? You need to show people, you need to show decision makers more than just numbers. You need to let your, num your number, which is your data, connect with them emotionally. So I'm going to give a case study in the next slide. And this case study is going to, you know, really take us deep dive into what this whole session is about. Please look at the screen, everybody. Can you read that case study? So an adult clothing company, it tends to venture into a new market. Assume you're working for this company. It's a UK company, they are into adult clothing and they want to venture into a new market. They want to expand, right? But they are considering Nigeria because they assume or they feel like Nigeria has a 200 million people population big market. But is this market really big? Should they venture into this market or should they not venture into this market as a data professional? Your work is to use data to advise them. Next slide. Let's see. If I'm to work on this, I'm not going to look at just the 200 million market or 200 million population. I will add the next layer to that data and that data points that we had is poverty. What bank defines people living below poverty as people that spend less than 2.17 per day? In Nigeria, 43% of Nigerians live on this number, less than this number. So, 83 million of them outside of the 200. If you remove 83 million from 200 million, supposed big market, what are you going to get? Let's not go to the next slide. Now, when you remove 83 million from the 200 million, you're left with 117 million, right? Of this 117 million, 20 million are children. Remove that again, you're left with maybe 97 million. Now, of the 97 million, let's say 7 million are held that. So these guys, they don't fancy your new clothes. They just want to leave, pass their time, and go to heaven. So they are not part of your market. Remove 7 million, you're left with 90. Every company has to draft what they call a customer personnel at one point. Who is your ideal customer target? Who are you targeting? 
When you do your customer personnel, you fuse all of these things into it, you're left with 40 million people in Nigeria. Is the market still big? I don't know. Now, because you're not the only person that is going to play in that market, there are already maybe existing players or other companies that are also trying to enter Nigeria. Competition leaves you with 4 million people. That's the actual size of the market. But on the surface, it seems like, hey, Nigeria is a 200 million, 200 million people market. Send all your goods and whatever to Nigeria. If you look at that data alone, without adding some spies or adding some context and stories to it, you're going to mislead your employer. But we're not stopping here. Please go to the next slide. Can we build a story around this? 83 million people that are living in Nigeria. 83 million people in Nigeria that are living in poverty. Now, this is very, 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 very critical. I ask a lot of people in this room, do you need money? You say, yeah. Are you among the 1% in this country? You say, no. Some people in this world we even identify as poor and broke. But let's add a story to this. 83 million people in Nigeria are living in poverty or even below the poverty line. But 87% of these people are living in northern Nigeria. 87% of 83 million people living in poverty are in northern Nigeria. Let's add another layer. Of all the wealth and prosperity in Nigeria, 85% of this wealth is in southern Nigeria. What does it mean? Only 15% of the wealth and prosperity of this country is in northern Nigeria. Let's go further. 85% of your prosperity in the southern Nigeria, but 72% of that wealth is in Lagos alone. But think about it. Lagos is just one state out of 17 states in southern Nigeria. So how rich is Lagos state? How rich is Lagos state? Now, don't you think the fact that you're living in Lagos, you have some privileges already? We'll find out from the next slide. If you are born or if, you, if you're living in Lagos, you have 13 times higher odds of getting educated. That you're born in Lagos already gives you 13% you know, increase odds that you're going to get education. But this number might not really make sense. Okay, education, I went to school, primary school. It shouldn't be a big deal. But this number is a big deal if you have stories to it, right? That's 13... <laughs> People in Lagos have 13 times higher odds of, go of getting education means that there's a concentration of skilled labor in Lagos. Founders in the house, if you're looking for developer, product marketer, you know, etc., just put your location as Lagos, you'll get a lot of application. Try somewhere else, you'll struggle to even get five. So there's a concentration of skilled labor in Lagos. What does that mean? Because there's a concentration of skilled labor in Lagos, it means companies are interested in getting started or having a branch in Lagos because they're skilled labor. They won't look at Kaduna, maybe they won't look at Akure, maybe they won't look at Eboe, but everybody wants to be in Lagos. It starts from the fact that if you are born in Lagos, you have 13 times more access to education than anywhere else. The education means there's access to skilled labor. The skilled labor means companies are interested in Lagos, but it doesn't stop there. Companies being interested in Lagos means there are more job opportunities in Lagos than anywhere else. We are still dealing with one data point, right? But we are getting all this insight from that one data point. Now, more jobs in Lagos means there's higher household income for people living in Lagos. Higher household income means that there's higher disposable income. After your basic need is being met and right, people in Lagos have extra money to spend on entertainment, which is why most of the shows, Olami Day, Whiskey, they all have their show in Lagos. Not Ibadan, not Sokoto, not Enugu. We are still dealing with one data point. Now, what does high disposable income mean? It means most of you in this room can afford a smartphone of maybe $500 or $300 because of your disposable income. But this $500 smartphone can feed 100 people. So the phone in your hand is probably 100 people's food in northern Nigeria. Still one data point, right? Please go to the next slide. That's the last slide. Yeah. That you have a smartphone means that you have access to Twitter. You have access to social media. Access to social media means that your mind is open. You can think for yourself. You have access to information. You have purchasing power. It also means that during elections, people in Lagos vote by might not work for them. Maybe this single data point, if we had stories to it, can tell us why a party lost in Lagos last year. The last slide, the last slide, please. 
So look, look at this now. Just to data point, population and poverty. When you have story to just these two data points, you can unlock a lot of insight. Data plus storytelling is really what you need to unlock insight. A lot of time, your data will not be enough. So add story to it, and you will complete this for me. So thank you very much for the audience. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Wale. You see, when I told you I was looking forward to the session, you can see what, what I meant. All right. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to move to the panel session. All right. But before then, we have a couple of interesting and important announcements. All right. First thing is there has been a couple of lost but found, lost but found situations, and we are happy about that. Uh, but still, some items are still missing. We have Orimo Airport. If you found that, uh, if it's not yours, please meet me. I'll be sitting somewhere there. Um, a silver umbrella in a red and silver bag. If you found that, please meet uh, myself or any of the protocols, and we would love to uh, collect that. Then good news, right? We also have companies that are recruiting, all right, that have requested that we share CV, all right, of interested data analysts, data engineers, data scientists with them. All right, they are all here, but time will not permit us for us to invite them to come speak. So what we'll do is that a QR code will be projected, all right, towards the end of the session. So please just scan it, and then you can send your CV. That will be way after the panel session. You can be able to send your CV, all right, to that QR code that will be projecting afterwards. All right, so now we'll move to the next session, which, I, like I said, is a panel session. And we have our panelists already in the room, all right? And um, so let me just give a, I think we should just go straight to what the panel session is all about. Then, of course, when they come on stage, the host will talk more about what they are going to be discussing. But essentially, the panel session is on building a data-driven culture, strategies, and challenges. Building a data-driven culture, strategies, and challenges. And we have three panelists. So first panelist, meet Yomi Ibusiola. Yomi is currently the Chief Data and Analytics Officer at Union Bank, where he is responsible for the overall ownership of the strategies for delivering insights across businesses. Yomi has led the development of several pragmatic solutions, and he has significant experience across Africa and internationally. Awesome. So while I invite the next person... I would like for us to, as we read the profile of our guests, please, let's give them a round of applause and they will be coming on stage. So please, Yomi, uh, if you are here, please kindly come up stage. Um, a round of applause for Yomi as it comes up stage. Our next panelist is Oluchi Eze. Oluchi is currently a fintech analytics leader at MTN Group, South Africa. A multi-award winner in transformation, innovation, and analytics a Microsoft Power Platform trainer, and a citizen developer with over 12 years of experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please make welcome Oluchi as she come up stage on the panel seat. Next, we have Abiodun Shomoye. Abiodun is a meticulous and passionate professional with a strong dedication to deriving valuable insights Computer science from the University of Ibadan. Please let's welcome Abiodun. A round of applause for Abiodun as it comes up stage. So remember, I told you we have gifts that we want to give out. All right. And then during uh, the gifts, that will be after the panel session. So please, you want to take notes. Most of the questions that we'll be asking will be coming from the panel session. So please take notes. All right. So I will hand over now to my friend and brother Ayo to take us on. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's put our hands together for the host. Thank you very much. And let's put our hands together once again for our panelists. I'm very, very excited about this session. Um, I heard Oluchi speak last year and it was fire. 
Um, your me also also happens to be a former boss of mine, and he's <laughs> he's so good. And then I've heard so much about Abiodo also. So let's just put our hands together again. All right, so we're going to be talking about building data culture. And I think I'll start with um, asking Yomi the first question. And so the first question is, why is it crucial for organizations to foster a data-driven culture in today's business landscape? Thanks, Aya. And um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, nice to be here. Um, we, we all know that I think practically all of us every day we make decisions. And if we make decisions as individuals, groups come together, make decisions up to the level of organizations. Organizations are bound to make decisions. What we found out over time and has been proven is that those decisions are best made with insights versus with gut feel. So, Question, why is it important for organizations to use data to make their decisions? It's because it allows you to be, uh, it increases your chances of making the best decisions. It increases, increases the chances of um, ensuring that at least there's something that is driving the decision you are making. Um, and I give, you, I give you an example. Um, I don't know if anybody here is into um, spot betting. Anybody? Anybody? Yes, thank you. I know there are people that are denying it here. So, think about it. When, when you are making decisions about spot betting, some of the things that drive your decisions are trends, right? What has happened in the past? What is the current form of this um, company? And I think there was a session yesterday where we spoke, there was something around sports, right? in an, an analytics and sports. So it's just like that. When you may want to make decisions, you need information, cognitive information that can help you to make those decisions. And it so happened that the better the quality of the information you have, the better your decision will be. And therefore, creating an organization where there's a data, um, a data drive for making those decisions based on data increases your chances. So if you have two competitors, the likelihood of a an organization with uh, better um, data, um, richer data, richer ability to mine their data, to make decisions, um, to exceed, exceed the other organization is much higher. All right, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Yomi. That is uh, very, very insightful. All right, so we'll go to the next question, um, and I'll be posing this to Oluchi. What are the common challenges organizations encounter when trying to establish a data-driven culture, and how can they be addressed? Okay, so I would speak from experience and what I've seen to happen in organizations over time. One of the major challenges is resistance to change. A lot of people, I mean, anything good or anything new is usually not 100% accepted. I mean, who, if you remember when you started to drive or when you started to do something new, it doesn't just come natural, especially if you're dealing with... Um, employees or resources that have been used to a certain way of life for a long time, it would pose a bit of a challenge, especially when they seem threatened by this innovation or this new way of doing things. So the resistance is one of the challenges that you would face when you're trying to drive um, data-driven organizations. Another issue that I've seen as well is lack of the right infrastructure. A lot of organizations don't have, like in terms of how their data is being processed, saved, you have a lot of data silos. So in cases like that, it will be very difficult for you to drive your, you know, your agenda, your culture in terms of data being data driven. Um, again, it's how you do it is most important. Now, another challenge as well is lack of data literacy. If people don't know how to use data, you cannot drive a data driven culture. It's a no brainer. That's basically how it works. So the most important thing is how you start training them, create the right infrastructure, and then, of course, getting senior leadership buy-in. Because if you, if you have, for example, you have different hierarchies in organizations, you have your, because the CEOs and the executives, you also have like the managers and um, probably the analysts. If you only have data-driven analysts 
and your CEO is not data driven. Your organization can never be data driven. So you will need to drive it from the top. And that's one of the challenges that I understand a lot of organizations face. You have people that want to be data driven, but at the top, there's a, there's a showstopper. So these are the issues. And once we start to address the issue from the top, especially at the leadership level, understanding how data literacy and coming up with trainings and engagements, you know, building data champions in different teams to drive this culture in-house, it would definitely improve how data driven. All right, thank you very much. Uh, very wonderful um, uh, response. So um, there's just something I want to highlight, which I like that you said, and it's the fact that, you know, data literacy is very, very critical. You find out that a lot of organizations believe that, or oh, once they have a data team, you know, they are data driven which isn't necessarily true, which speaks to why data literacy is very, very critical, just like you said. So I'll pose this to um, Abiodun, which is, so what are some of the strategies, right, that organizations can leverage to drive data literacy across the whole organization, beyond just the, you know, most senior person, which is the CEO in this case, being data driven, how can you actually, you know, drive data literacy across all the employees in, in, in an organization? All right, thanks so much and good afternoon, everyone. Um, the simple answer to that is investment. You need to invest in your people and your investments is not just um, financial investment in training. It's also very important to invest in the trust by being transparent to the entire process. Um, you, of recent, we're trying to uh, reinforce a data-driven mindset in an organization. And it's, it's a public organization, so I wouldn't be able to mention the name. We realized that even though the leadership were quite very interested in driving uh, data-driven culture, uh, the work model, the work demand was practically against it. And investing in training would definitely would have been counterproductive because one, the staff would not have had time to go for the training. They could have gone for the training, would not have had time to commit emotionally, physically, and otherwise to the training so they can learn from the training. So what was done was that they were very transparent in communicating the aim of the training, letting them know what the competitive advantage of getting involved in that training is. And also they lay down clearly uh, the KPIs that being data-driven would make them to achieve and what they will be targeting. So they made quite the case of um, for competitive advantage, certain scenarios of where it was being done, where it's been done, and the advantage they are deriving from it. Beyond that, they rescheduled the uh, activity of the team. So the team of, I think, about 100 or so. At that point, they had to give uh, a form of um, training leave. So they couldn't allow everyone to go on training at some point at the same time. But what they did was to apportion into um, buckets. First 10 people go, next 10 people, I mean, next the uh, remaining population stay back at work. So they made it more like collaborative. So the fact that I'm going on training doesn't mean that my work will not be attended to. If you don't attend to my work when I, when I, went, if I, if I go on training, but your time going on training as well, I will not attend to your work. So there was a bit of dependency that created this collaborative mindset. And against Creating is the man that looks like you are, being, you are throwing them at competitive uh, um, engagement. I feel those are um, not, not non monetary investments, those are, um, what I call it, uh, qualitative investments in your people. Giving them the trust, letting them know where they will go to or what they can do, informing them of the efficiency of adopting this process will go a long way in ensuring that uh, data delivering uh, mindsets beyond just word became and becomes rather a reality in an organization. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for highlighting the importance of investment, especially trainings, right, in driving data literacy. Okay, so I'll come back to Yomi. So Yomi, you had already spoken about how um, when a company is data-driven, right, you're able to make the most optimal decisions, right? We know that a lot of times people just use intuition or the most experienced or most senior person in a room just thinks, you know what? The industry has been going in this direction. Competitors are going in this direction. Therefore, we are going in this direction, right? So it's a common thing you see in a lot of organizations. So Yomi, how would you explain or how do you communicate 
the value of being data driven to an organization, especially an organization where they're so much used to intuition, right? And just looking at what is going on around to, to make decisions. Um, it's, it's not, it's not um, an easy journey. And um, anybody here who has tried to do it will tell you probably the same thing. Um, communication of value in the data space is, um, some, is almost like a, it should almost be a cost on its own. Um, but it's also not a journey that you, is, uh, that cannot be um, achieved. Uh, but the first thing you should realize is that it's not something you can, there's no silver bullet. And you can't say, this is what would always work. But I think that I can give you a few nuggets of, what, of ways to go about it. Um, I think the first thing that tends to work well is your ability to define and draw up what the future is. So what exactly is the end game for us? If, we, if, we, if all, all things work well for us in, with our data, this is what it will be. It means that Mr. H uh, would sit in his house, be able to get an insight early in the morning about what he should be doing today. Um, Mrs. Y would be able to finish work early because all of the insights she needs comes early and she can finish her work and all of that. So you need to draw up a, a vision of the future. Um, I think being where, uh, and based on my experience, one of, the, um, one of the challenges of us being data people is also that we think very qualitative, and very quantitative, and we lack the capacity for, quali um, not capacity, but we struggle with qualitative communication. And a lot of times, value is communicated both with quantitative and qualitative measures. So you must be able to flex your style and learn those things that are not natural to you, such that you can be able to improve your capability for storytelling, be able to improve your capacity for drawing a vision and sharing a vision that somebody can buy into. Another thing that tends to work well is also celebrate your little successes. So if you're doing something well within the data space and it's looking great to you, even before it gets to, um, to other parties, be the first person to go and tell that story. And as you're telling the story, also ensure that you use the opportunity to go back to phase one. Tell them about the future as well. So we've taken this step, but remember, we're going to this place. I think that helps to create a mindset that there's value in the data. Having said all of that, it does not mean that you still would not look for quantitative measures to use because that's where your strength lies, right? However, you must be able to find the right balance of what would make and convince a business leader to continue to make investments in data. Remember that data, as much as it's, it's been in the, in the, in, in our, um, on our lips for the past five to 10 years a lot, the reality is the, it's not widespread yet. These competencies, these skills growing every day, but it's not widespread yet. So a lot of people don't even know the capacity of the, day, of the data. They don't even know what they can do with it. So it is almost like you seeing yourself as an evangelist of your data and making sure that the same way you sell something that is big to you is the same way um, that you sell this as well to leaders. Yeah, th th thank you very much, Yomi. I, 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 really like, <laughs> I really like the fact that, I mean, the part where you said, you know, celebrate those milestones, celebrate those wins, right? Because I think that at the end of the day, you know, stake, that's what stakeholders want to see. They want to see the value to the business, right? And as they start to see that value, it gives the team visibility, it gives, you know, it, it also gets their buy-in in a sense, right? Which is why I think it's a very, very great point. So just building on that, um, Oluchi, so I know that as you start to communicate these things, right, you still find resistance. And I know you already talked about resistance to change. You know, how do you, you know, in communicating that value, as you start to meet with um, cultural resistance, how do you overcome you know, that resistance to ensure that the value is really seen and the organization can become more data driven. All right. I like to speak from experience, right? One of the ways I see that you can really not necessarily solve the issue of resistance, but address it in a very progressive manner is identify who 
the champions that are resisting the change is. So the skeptics, I would like to call them. And then bring them on board in your individual project. So I'll give an example. If you're working on a particular use case, or maybe in line with the example that Yomi gave in terms of sharing wins, data wins, or you worked on a project and there's a success. However, you still have skeptics. Understand why there's this, some level of skepticism, right? And try to address those issues. Again, bring them on board, take them through the journey of the project that you're working on, and then begin to communicate the value. Let them not just hear it from you, but see it and see how you have applied um, the value of data in solving tangible, re relatable business problems. Again, nobody, nobody doubts results. I mean, we can doubt any other thing, but you cannot doubt results. If a business has been struggling with customer acquisition, for example, you have a lot of customers churning or you have revenue declining, and then you're able to leverage data in a particular use case, to turn that particular business problem around. Nobody's gonna doubt you as you progress. So engage these stakeholders, address their concerns, and bring them along with you on the journey of you trying to solve this problem. And don't start with a very big project, because I know sometimes you always want to sound fancy and do some very huge stuff. Look for small, quick wins. A very simple business problem that you can address with data. And then, you know, bring these guys along, solve this problem, and let them see the impact of, you know, your application of data to that business problem. And I think they, they will move from being skeptics to evangelists. That's all. all right. Thank, thank you very much. I like what you said about, you know, starting small and not, you know, trying to <laughs> stretch yourself thin. All right. You wanted to add? Yeah, I wanted to okay, add. Okay, okay, like, okay. Great. I, I shared the experience that uh, all she just uh, cited. I had a similar example, I mean, scenario with a project. I think what happened was the technically the C level man in the department had communicated his frustration to his team members. And in his words, this was very brutal in his words. He had been saying it consistently that once I get the solution, I can get this job done, I'll get rid of all of you. So it's just that's what he communicates anytime he's upset. So when he brought us on board that we should come and solve the, I mean, create a, uh, a data analytics solution and all. We are very excited because it was a very massive project. But when we got there, we met this highly resistant team. One thing that that taught me was, as far as we're very good with infrastructure, we knew the um, stack to develop and all. The team owed very confidentially the business rule guiding the activity of that uh, department. And unfortunately, um, the, the C level was also imported from abroad. So he didn't have the domain knowledge guiding the activity. So when we are doing um, customer journey analysis, trying to extract business rules so we can, but there's nothing we are doing, we don't understand the business rule or not. We realize that we are just getting either monosyllabic responses or Boolean responses. Is this available? Yes. How do you do it? Um, I think I have a meeting now. So let's, let's talk in the next one hour. We'll go back there after one hour. How are you doing it? Oh. Uh, my colleague that is that handles it has gone to the restroom when he comes back. Which was, so at the end of the day, it became evident that they were not put in the loop of the uh, decision that bet the idea of automating the process. Uh, what really worked at that point was that my team lead had to talk to the person that brought us, which is the C level here, yeah, to set up a meeting. And we made critical, just like you said, those that, uh, those that are at the forefront of the resistance. To be, the, to be the project manager. So if the project fails, it's not that the project just failed, your so-called business understanding has failed, the entire team has failed. So bringing them and getting them involved in the entire process created this sense of belonging that essentially inflicted the progress of the project and were able to um, um, all right, deliver. And at the end of the day, none of them got sacked. And that's what they got to know that those are sacking when the project comes on board were just made threats to, to, to convey disappointment at that point. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Happy All right. So we'll just take two questions from the crowd and then any of our panelists to respond. Can I see any hands? You have a culture, you have a question rather on data culture. All right. Please come. And all right. You can also come. Thank you. Very quickly.
All right, so okay. just very quickly, and then our okay, panelists, thank you very any much. of our panelists my name is can Gift. answer. My name is Gift Wareta. So um, I kind of like what you said about resistance. So but what will you advise someone do in a situation where you want to bring an innovation that's going to help uh, business? And the major resistance is not because they don't see the power, but because they fear uh, probably some kind of money uh, that we get in, especially maybe your line manager or some other persons, those cheap money coming, they're going to lose it. And in a way, sometimes they meet you and they even tell you, uh, your line manager kind of tell you that if you do this, I won't be able to get X, Y, Z again, you know, that backyard money. How do you continue with that innovation? Do you just keep quiet and walk away? Thank you. <laughs> I like that question. Okay. So it's a very, very tricky scenario. But I will tell you what I would do if I were... I mean, it's a very similar situation, but not in terms of money, right? You, some resistances are understandable, some are not. Fraud is not understandable. If you're stealing from the company or you are an opposition to change because of your personal interest, it's not my responsibility to cater to you. However, I will find a way, I would recommend you find a way to let them see the value. Now, I will address it in the terms of fear of losing your job. You mentioned that example. What I would recommend you do, or what I personally did was, I look for the quickest person in the team that I can convince. Because if you're working with a full team and everybody's resisting, look for who has the most impact. So I'll give an example. I worked in a team where there was no innovation, 100%. Everybody was doing things manually some years back. And mm -hmm. when it comes to month end, you know how if you've worked in organizations where they do month end reporting and everything shuts down because you are reporting, right? So basically what was happening was that a lot of people were lodged in a hotel, being paid over time, you know, making extra money, literally from doing things manually that could literally be automated, save the business money, and of course, drive value. But of, somebody was benefiting from it. They were making more money from the organization because they were working more, right? What you would do is not to walk away. I would not recommend you walk away. I would recommend that you begin to engage the major stakeholders. It could be the accountants, for example. I'll give an example. And then you begin to explain the value for you working over time, you're not going to be with your family over the weekend or whatever period. Sell the benefits to them, but not in terms of money. Sell the fact that you have more time to do other things. You are able to, of course, learn a skill of the future. Because one of the things that I think happens is when you are trying to drive innovation, it's not necessarily about what it does for the business. It's also what it does for you as a person. So when you also engage them in the sense that we are, the business is going to be better for it, you are also going to grow from this. You can learn this skill and own this process as opposed to somebody else doing it for you. Because guess what? You may not allow me to do it, but this organization may bring in a consultant and you can't say no to that. So you have the choice now to accept this innovation and be at the forefront and probably champion it as the case may be. But again, there are some things you cannot handle and you need to be able to cut your losses. But address what you can and still go ahead. But I think another last point I'd like to mention is find the person that will benefit the most from your innovation. It could be the executive of that function and sell your innovative value to them. The executioners will eventually align. It's just what it is, right? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Yomi wants to add yeah, something. I just wanted to add a couple of sentences. I think um, what you what you experience is normal in any in any world. Um, disrupt anything disruptive. I think we've mentioned that multiple times here today. Anything disruptive will always um, be challenged. But a couple of things just to bear in mind. One is none of us here will go very far with just being smart data people. We're going to excel based on multiple competences. Part of the competences you need to learn is how to manage change. That's the, my, my first point. My second point to you is, it is 
common. In fact, the most, the only thing that you can be sure of in every circumstance is that things will change. So the fact that you've started something and there is resistance to it means that the day for it is coming. So she has given you very lovely advice, find a few things, but also you need to learn the waiting game. As part of your development, you need to learn how long it will wait. And as you're waiting, you see, you learn in the, in the process because you're going to be disrupting things. Like we've said, somebody's going to lose something. Um, so you need to know how to manage those kind of scenarios and develop the competences, the other competences beyond your technical competence to be able to excel. All right, thank you very much. Yomi. So we'll take the second question. All right, go ahead. All right, thanks for this session. My question is a little bit about data literacy. I was in a situation early this year, I was in a startup and the boss was not data literate. And then there was always this demand, we want to do AI, we want to do this, we want to do that. To, you, have, you don't even have data to start with. So we have to even talk about, I'm just a data scientist, I'm not a data engineer. We have to get data engineer, data this, data that. So that's one scenario. How can we handle such case? Then the second scenario, I was in an interview. It was a startup also. And um, the boss, I was doing the interview and I was getting this feedback that, okay, we want to go global. We want to do this, we want to do that. We want to see how we can implement AI. And I was like, there's no data. So how, while I believe that they want to be innovative, they want to be global, they want to stretch. So how do we pass such message that we need to balance in terms of data, in terms of starting with what we have, or we have to outsource historical data and all of that. So that's my question. All right, who wants to take? Anybody can take the question. <laughs> uh, so, see, all of us here, we are part of that problem, eh? You know why? Because we tell them that data will solve all their problems. And anytime you tell them that, they then go and read a little bit on Google. And Google tells them, ah, Netflix became this. Google became this. And every organization wants growth, right? But it's a journey. And I think we mentioned that before. Um, but there are some things we've said here that will help you. One of the things is you are an evangelist. You need to tell them the reality. See, you cannot, you cannot do, you, there's nothing you can do with ML if you don't have any data. In fact, one of the, a lot of the people, one of the things that makes my my organization attractive to young data scientists, um, ML engineers, is because is it data you are looking for? You will be lost in it. But where they are coming from, they would have learned the skills, but unfortunately, they don't have the data to learn. So it is a bit of a difficult circumstance, right? But it, it's also something that you have a bit of responsibility for it, which is you are an evangelist. You're a data evangelist, whether you like it or not. So you need to tell them what is doable. See, we have over, we've sold data, and I think we've all here done a good job about it, on it. However, you need to bring them to ground zero. See, there are a number of things that can happen. So yes, clearly, um, they can imp you can implement AI, you can do this and that for them but it takes time. And these are the things you need to help you to do it. So per scenario, in each of our cases, we need to look at what do I need to be able to achieve what the bot's vision is. What they've said to you might be a vision that might take 10 years. They tell you they want it today, but you are the one to turn it into a journey and say, look, this is the journey. This is where we are today. This is where we will be. And let there be a roadmap for it. But it is your work because you are the one sitting in that space. So you need to evangelize. You need to make them understand. So you do some a bit of data education, and I think they probably would um, will be better off for it. All right, thank you, thank you very very much. Let's put our hands together once again. Uh, we've come to the end of the session. So thanks to our panelists. Um, just very quickly, we have some awards which we'd like to give you. I'm on stage. Let's just wait as they bring it. All right, thank you.
Let's see which ones first. Stuff for Yomi. All right. All right. So I'd like to invite Yomi. Can we just put our hands together for Yomi as we hand over the award? Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's put our hands together for Abiodun as we invite him over. And let's put our hands together for Oluchi as she comes over. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so let's just clap for them as we all go down the stage. You can make that bigger. You can make that bigger. Thank you so much. Amazing. You know, I like to call myself a man of my words. So like I said, we're going to have quiz. Very, very short quiz, right? Um, just to test how well we've learned, you know, from our experts. So I have three questions, all right? But I want to give away two hoodie. I have three questions. I want to give away two hoodie. So this is what I would do. When I ask the question, please listen well. There are rules, right? There are rules to this game. So, so because I know we have over 2,000 people, so we must be able to manage it. And by the way, of course, we are all winners, right? And I really think we should give ourselves a round of applause, really. We've been doing excellently well so far. You know, thank you so much. So we'll take a quick the quiz, and then afterwards we'll have a sponsorship session, all right? Um, so can we have the, the UDI? If I, the UDI, please. So, I'll ask two questions, just in case I don't have answer to any of them, now, then I'll ask the third one. So, this is what I would do. The first response must come from people after these, uh, you see these uh, dividing pillars? So, I'll call one person, and then at the back, I'll also call one person. So, if you know the answer, this is what you do. Just raise your hand, all right, and then I will call. Does that make sense? You raise your hand and I will call. So permit me as I call. This is just, you know, there's nothing, nothing special, right? It's just we asking, how well have you learned? I know every one of us have learned a lot. So the first question goes to group one. <laughs> People are raising hand already. Okay. The first question goes to group one, which is this across this whole border. And the question is, what is the title of the just concluded panel session? You have the answer, you raise your hand and I will call you. Okay. All right, so let me call the lady in, in yellow. Good. So, <laughs> okay, no, I, I already called one person. So if that person doesn't know it, then I will look this way and then. Okay, so my name is Prisla. The name of the um, Just Ended panel sh session, that's the title, is um, Building a Data-Driven Culture, Strategies and Challenges. Interesting. Thank you so much. Please give her a round of applause. Building a Data-Driven Culture, Strategies and Challenges. So she has the, that. Then for the second group, now this time around, I'll look at this angle. <laughs> you are raising your hand already. This question is difficult, though. Who amongst the panelists said, start with small wins, and seek to carry the skeptics along so that they can become data and insight evangelists. Who among the panelists? So you must give the full name of the person. All right? So that lady in white. Okay, she, she, she gave up. I used to, okay, she gave up. Okay, a guy. Let's do a guy now. Somewhere at the back. Okay, that guy on red. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you. Hurry up, please. If you can come forward, let's let, you know. We need to be sure. Who among the panelists said, start with small wins and seek to, to carry the skeptic along so that they can become data and insight evangelists? Uh, Yomi Busiola. Wrong. Ah, oh, you wasted my question. <laughs> no, I have to call the second group, guys. Oh, you wasted my question. Okay. 
No, I, I have to call the second row. Sorry. So that lady on green at the back. Can you echo the answer? No, by the way, it's going to be a guesswork now. Cancelled. Next question. Cancelled. As, yeah, I don't want guesswork. Because you're all, you know, data scientists. You know how to tweak things, even if you don't get it. As data professionals, we must be an evangelist of your data and insight. You must find the right balance to communicate value through qualitative and quantitative approach. Who among the panelists said this? So I'm looking at the bar. Okay, so that guy on ash color. Yes, you. Yeah, please stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it to us. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Say that again. Full name. Your me, Ibisola. Please give him a round of applause. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have the hoodie. You're part of the Discord channel. Data First Africa Discord channel. Discord channel. Ah, okay. I like that. I like that. <laughs> Okay, okay. Okay, you know what, guys? <laughs> okay, so the major... <laughs> okay, so that's fine. Because we have the rules, I think we just give him. Let's give him. What is the know about? We should give him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's give him, yes. <laughs> I, I thought you guys were with me now. We should make it other. Uh... Ah, I like that. I like that. Let's give ourselves a round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So, guys, we are moving towards the end. Like I told you earlier on, we have recruiters who are interested in hiring, right? So, if you have your CV already prepared, the QR code will be projected. So, please, if you can have the QR code projected so that um, we can scan and then just share your CV. I think there are basic questions, maybe what role and then your CV. So please do that, uh, and then we would share accordingly with the uh, recruiters. So while we do that, I'm going to call the next speaker. Uh, it's a sponsor session, 10-minute sponsor session by Proof Up. All right, so representative of Proof Up, please uh, kindly make your way to the stage. All right, so please let's give him a round of applause. Okay, the QR is here, okay. So, oh, I thought that was him. <laughs> Okay, prove up. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Then after prove up, we're going to have a lightning talk uh, of 10 minutes. And yeah, we are, we are close to the end, right? Close to the end. So please, let's give a representative of prove up a round of applause as it comes up stage. Thank you so much. A lot of people are scanning. Um, all right. All right. No, no, guys, we still project it. Trust me, we'll project it again and again. We'll project it again and again. So, yeah, you, we'll do that. So, we, we kindly request that, please, if you are standing at the back, you know, we still have some seats here. Kindly find a place to sit, all right? We still have some time where you can network, you know, before we leave. All right, so over to you, sir. Yeah, hello, greetings, everyone. Yeah, so I won't take much of your time. I'll take, like, five minutes. So, maybe I can borrow my time for you to do your scanning. Is that fine? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my name is Francis Jayola. I represent Proverb. I don't know if you can pull up the slide. Yeah, so Proverb is uh, a tech firm. So what we do is, uh, you can go to the next slide. So what we do is uh, web design, mobile app, software, advertising, and data, which is why most of us are here today, or virtually all of us are here today. Uh, so we have a hub in Abuja, the only hub. Though we have a mini one here in Lagos, but it's not for guests to come in. We are building a bigger one in Abuja where people can come. So hopefully, if you sign up on one of our platforms, when that one is ready, you will get the invitation to come and then see what we do. So the major reason why we are here today is to launch one of our products. We as a tech company, we develop multiple products. But there's one that is so specific to Nigeria. So it has a lot of data stuff inside. I don't know if you can go to the next slide so we can introduce. So 
we can skip all this one. I say I'm giving you five minutes of my time. So just skip, skip this. Skip up to, yeah, stop here. So we're introducing a platform called AdNaira. AdNaira is a marketplace for advertisers and promoters. So uh, to make you understand what we do better, I guess some of us know Upwork or Fiverr. If you know Upwork or Fiverr, you've used it before. Uh -huh. So imagine that kind of platform just for advertising. So somebody that wants to promote uh, his company service, each, any kind of advertising service comes on the platform, puts it up there. If you as a promoter want to take up that and do it, you do it and then you chat with the advertiser. If you complete the tax, then you get paid. It's straightforward. Now, it might look simple the way I said it, but there's a lot going on there. The platform is just like an escrow that tracks the two of you, the advertisers and the promoters, to ensure the work gets done. So now, here's where the data come in now. If, if you are tracking what has been done, the clicks, the impression, the location, the targeting, even the forecast of the data itself. So we use uh, AI to power some of all this data and then use some all these uh, data, term, and data terms that we know about. But I'm just going to skip that. I'm just here to just introduce this platform for you. So you can learn more about it on the next slide, which is the adnera.com. Yeah, so the next slide. So yeah, adnera.com to learn more about it. Sign up either as an advertiser or as a promoter. I hope I didn't take more than five minutes. So you can use that time now to scan your code. Yeah, so thank you for having me. You're so generous. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Please give it up for Proven Hub, our one of our esteemed partners. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, so yes, please can you put the the scan the QR code up so we can scan. So while that is up, I'll call our next speaker, uh, David F. Young, uh, who is going to give a lightning talk on data governance, the key to unlocking the value of your data. Uh, David F. Young. Please, if you are here, kindly come to the front. Okay, David is on his way. Please give him a round of applause. We are still scanning. How long does it take to scan now? Is it not just point and... Okay, there, there are questions on it. Okay, it's all good. All right, David, thank you. <laughs> okay. So okay, can we, can we move on now, guys? I'm still scanning. I don't understand. <laughs> all right. I promise you, we'll put it up again. All right. So please, for time, let us have David uh, give us his lightning talk. Thank you so much, David. Over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Ligon. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. I trust we've been having a great um, session throughout this conference yesterday and today. And this is the last talk for the event. All right, so today I'll be talking about data governance, the key to unlocking the value of your data. Um, throughout this conference, we've been hearing lots of stuff about data analytics, business intelligence, machine learning, and all other interesting stuff. But on this talk, I'm just going to be focusing on data governance. Next slide, please. Yep. My name is David F. Young. Here you can follow me. I work with Sterling Bank as data engineer currently. You can follow me on Twitter, LinkedIn, and also on YouTube. David Data. Next, please. And um, I have a fun fact. My fun fact is that I love eating beans because I believe it makes me tall. Yeah. I have my data. Don't worry. <laughs> I have my data. All right. Let's go. Next. Okay. So in the next 10 minutes, what is my goal? My goal is to have every one of us listen to me right now to have a mind shift. And what is mind shift? No longer see data governance as an afterthought or a nice to have, but a must have in your data strategy. In the just concluded panel session, talking about um, data driven cultures, strategies, one of the key strategies for a data driven culture is data governance. And my goal in the next 10 minutes is to help you see this and help you make a mind shift. Even though you work for an enterprise or you work for a startup, there is a place you can start in your data governance journey. And that's my goal for these 10 minutes. Next, please. All right. If you can see this slide, you will notice the staircase. We have data governance at the bottom, engineering, analytics, data science, artificial intelligence. 
in reality, this is what a lot of organizations' data look like. Just like the question uh, my brother asks, people say, oh, we want to do AI, we want to do chat GPT, large language models, machine learning, interesting stuff, right? But then they jump the foundations. Um, interestingly and thankfully, a lot, a lot of people are now beginning to see the value of data engineering and analytics before jumping up to data science and AI. But then a lot of organizations still forget the last rung of the ladder, which is data governance. And what happens is that, next slide, please. You have organizations' data infrastructure, data architecture, data solutions looking like this. It has a house. It's, it's a house. It's functioning. Your data is working. Your AI is working. Your machine learning models are working. Your dashboards are working. Everything seems to be working very well. But there is no foundation sitting on it. And oftentimes, this realization usually comes up when you try to scale things. When you try to solve bigger problems, you begin to realize that, oh, this is not here. You employ a new staff, and they're trying to figure out, what does this table do? What does that table do? You know, an engineer has a pipeline that is broken, and he has to read several lines of code to understand what broke that pipeline. Or in manufacturing industry, there is a, a defect in the product, and they're trying to understand the root cause, but they don't know how data is flowing. So you begin to see the results, the, or the results of this faulty structure in other areas. Next slide, please. Now, this is the Dama DM Book of Knowledge Framework for Data Management. And if you notice something on this slide, you'll see that the bottom rung there is data governance. Underneath it, or rather, above it, you have data quality, uh, metadata management, BI, AI, machine learning, all the interesting stuff you're talking about. But the foundation of it all is data governance. As those of us who are Christians will say, if the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? A lot of people, your data architecture, your data strategies are with 40 foundations if you don't have anything on data governance. And like I said earlier, my goal is to help you to understand that this is a very critical area for you to bring into your data use, your data organization, or your data architecture and infrastructure. Next slide, please. A survey was done to ask organizations, why are you not practicing data governance, right? Like one of, one of the panelists said, we, we have preached so much about data, data. People are talking about data. But then people are using data, but then they're not starting from the foundation, which is governance. And they were asked, why are you not doing this? 55% said the reason they're not doing this is because there is no structured framework of them implementing a data governance solution. Now, this is true for almost every area of data. You would agree with me that the field of data is an evolving field, right? It is not like accounting or medicine or law that is standardized. We are still evolving. Um, a couple of years back, we had a new rule referred to as analytics engineering. And new roles are coming up, machine learning engineering, DevOps engineering, interesting new roles because data ecosystem is evolving. This is also true for the data governance space as well. Because the space is still a bit new, that sort of thing, people are not able to understand how to implement that framework. And my goal, again, is to help you see this and let you know how you can simply implement this wherever you are. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've been talking about data governance, data governance, and I know somebody, or I may guess that somebody may be asking, what exactly is data governance? Um, in very simple terms, data governance is people, processes, and technology. People, managing and governing roles, responsibilities of people who produce the data, people who analyze the data and transform the data, people who store that data, processes. What are the processes involved in creation, 